Hello everyone, welcome back to Ancient Greece and Rome. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of late antiquity, um, the end of the Roman civilization. We'll begin by discussing Emperor Constantine, his life and his policies, including his religious beliefs. And that will lead us into a discussion of how Christianity becomes institutionalized in the Roman civilization. The Christian population grows, eventually becoming the majority religion in the empire, and eventually Christianity will become the state religion, and there will even be persecution of, of non-Christian non uh, pagan people, uh, as they were uh, called. Uh, we'll talk about some of the other emperors after Constantine, emperors like Julian, uh, often called the apostate because he was a pagan who pushed back against Christianity. We'll talk about other emperors like Theodosius I, um, who further institutionalizes Christianity and uh, will make it the uh, state religion of the empire. And we'll also talk about the fall of the Western Roman Empire, its causes and its effects. And a lot of these causes had been um, germinating for many years, long before the crisis of the 200s, um, things like the debasement of currency, military issues, um, demographic changes, these factors will contribute to the fall of the uh, Roman uh, Empire. And we'll talk about how that happens, at least in the Western Empire, the uh, Germanic invasions that take place um, as Germanic peoples that had settled in Roman territory and initially had been allies of the Romans will turn on the Romans and that will lead to the sacking of Rome and ultimately to the dissolution of the Western Roman Empire. We'll talk about uh, major historical figures, major actors involved, and we'll talk about uh, what archaeological evidence we have uh, related to the destruction of the Western Roman Empire. And we'll talk about some of the other long-term reasons why the Western Roman Empire fell. We'll address some ideas in popular culture uh, that people have about why, uh, why the Roman Empire fell, at least in the West, why the Eastern Roman Empire, often called the Byzantine Empire, why it lasted uh, almost a thousand years longer. And we'll compare and contrast um, the East and the West. And that will include a discussion of uh, life in the, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. And the image on this slide is a um, painting um, from about the year 1890, and it shows uh, the Visigoths pulling down a uh, Roman statue with what looks like uh, the help of a Roman slave. There's good evidence to suggest that um, Slaves um, helped uh, groups like the Visigoths in their uh, defeat of the Western Roman Empire. And this painting, I, I think, illustrates uh, the role that slaves and slavery would have played in the dissolution of uh, the Roman Empire. Remember, though, that uh, statues were uh, typically painted in uh, the Roman civilization. So perhaps this statue, um, all the paint came off because Rome is collapsing, it can no longer be properly maintained, or the painter uh, just wasn't aware that uh, Roman statues were, were painted. So with our previous discussion of the rise of Christianity and the spread of, the, of Christianity throughout the uh, Roman Empire, as well as uh, the persecution that Christians faced in the Roman Empire, I want to talk about Constantine the first and um, how he put an end to uh, the persecution of Christians. We'll also talk about Constantine's uh, religious beliefs, his identity as a Christian, what evidence we have, what we know, and we'll connect um, his personal beliefs as far as we can tell them to uh, his policies. So we'll begin by uh, noting that Constantine the first was the son of Constantius the first. Constantius I was a junior emperor, a Caesar, in the Western Roman Empire, and his mother was a woman named Helena. Helena was of Greek ancestry, and it's believed that Helena was a Christian. And some scholars and theologians think that Helena played a role in um, Constantine's coming to Christianity. 
Constantine was born in what is now Serbia in 272 CE. So he's not from uh, Italia. He's not from um, sort of the cultural heartland of, of the Roman civilization, and nor, nor is he from a very wealthy part of uh, the Roman civilization like Egypt or, or Greece. And actually, he will spend a lot of his uh, life on the frontier fighting as a soldier as well. So um, that also may have played a role in his decision to become a Christian. He maybe was perhaps dissatisfied with the Roman upper class, the Roman elite, who were uh, generally uh, pagan. In the year uh, 306, uh, Constantine will become uh, emperor of the Western Roman Empire. And he had been in uh, politics for, for many years before then. Um, he had been uh, in the court of, of previous uh, Roman emperors. He certainly would have been aware of the uh, Diocletian persecution or the great persecution of Christians that occurred in the, occurred in the year 313 and would continue it would continue even after uh, Diocletian abdicated um, his, his rule. Some people think that Constantine may have already been a Christian at this point, and he was uh, hiding uh, his, his faith to avoid being persecuted. Others think that Constantine may not have been a Christian yet, but his witnessing of the suffering of Christians, the uh, violence that they were facing, the executions they were facing, uh, many Christians' refusal to give up their faith, even when faced with death, that would have caused Constantine to become sympathetic with Christians, and that he would have opposed this kind of violence uh, against them. And perhaps he also feared for the safety of his mother, Helena, who uh, was a Christian. The traditional story uh, that uh, you most often hear about Constantine's conversion to Christianity or his decision to become a Christian uh, involves a vision or dream he had shortly before the Battle of Milvian Bridge, uh, October 28, 312 CE. Before the battle, it was said that uh, Constantine had a um, vision um, in which he saw um, the um, Cairo symbol, the first two letters of uh, Christ in the sky, and then that he heard a message or saw a message that said uh, in Latin, in hook, uh, signo vinces, in this sign, conquer, that he's supposed to put the Cairo symbol onto his shields and onto his uh, banners and uh, standards, and that uh, Christ uh, will give him power to be victorious over his enemies. Remember, Cairo are, um, these are the first uh, two letters in uh, the Greek, uh, the Greek term for Christ. And Constantine is uh, victorious at the Battle of uh, Milvian Bridge. We'll talk about uh, that battle uh, on a later slide. But um, at that battle, uh, Constantine defeats his rival, Maxentius, who had rebelled against uh, Constantine's rule. So by defeating Maxent Maxentius, um, Constantine is able to solidify his power in the, uh, the Western Roman Empire. And eventually, Constantine will become um, ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire as well, will rule as one uh, Roman emperor, although this um, rule of, of one, one emperor for the entire empire will, will not last. Some scholars postulate that um, Constantine um, professed Christianity and chose to have Christian symbols on his standards and, and his troops' shields. This may have been a genuine um, choice by Constantine because he had become a Christian and he wanted to um, symbolize his faith. Others suggest that perhaps the decision was a bit more cynical. Um, Maxentius had uh, made um, overtures to Christians in Italia to get their support. That way he could more effectively resist Constantine. And it's possible that Constantine was trying to make sure that former supporters of Maxentius, like Christians, would come over to his side and they would see that Constantine was a Christian and they would support him. And then with the um, Edict of Milan in 313, Christianity um, is going to be tolerated within the, uh, the Roman, the Roman uh, Empire. And remember, Milan is, is the Western Roman capital at this time. 
So scholars, theologians, historians will debate um, Constantine's motives for becoming a Christian, and they will debate his sincerity and his adoption of Christianity. Was it genuine faith or was it more cynical? He was trying to gain power and gain support from Christians. And scholars will actually even debate the story of Constantine's vision. Um, this vision is recounted by uh, what are called ecclesiastical histories or uh, ecclesiastical historians write these accounts about uh, the visions. Ecclesiastical historians, their goal is um, different than a traditional academic historian uh, who is just trying to learn as much about the past as possible. An ecclesiastical historian is trying to tell a history of Christianity and of Christian people and of miraculous events in order to basically prove the Christian faith. So uh, there's issues that um, there's motivations um, in, in what these ecclesiastical historians um, write. They're going to look for any kind of miraculous event and they're going to try to make it seem as, as supernatural and miraculous as possible. So there may be some exaggeration. Certainly there's an issue of, of, of bias, but in many ways all works of history are going to have a bias. Ecclesiastical histories will have a certain direction they're trying to go. Um, the older classicizing histories that we talked about in previous videos Suetonius, Tacitus, uh, Livy, etc. Their bias, their goal was to ingratiate themselves um, to whoever was the current emperor. So uh, no one group has a monopoly on, on bias. And the key to reading sources is understanding that, you know, everyone has sort of a, a direction or an angle they're going at. And it's, it comes down to what questions you ask of a historical text. And of course, this is also why archaeology is important. You can use material sources to um, analyze documentary sources as well. Some other policies uh, during Constantine's reign were the banning of gladiatorial games in 325 CE. Allegedly, Constantine banned the games because he did not think that gladiatorial contests belonged in a civil society because of how violent they were. Others suggest that his decision was more cynical and it was to take gladiators who were generally slaves and put them into other kinds of labor like mining. Either way, though, the games are basically brought back by 328 CE. They'll actually have to be banned again in 393 CE by Theodosius I. And it's not really going to be until about the 440s that basically gladiatorial games are done. They have to be banned politically and then culturally uh, they just fall out of favor in favor of other things like chariot races and theater, which are less violent and less likely to um, go against uh, Christian uh, beliefs because gladiatorial contests were religious uh, events as well. They weren't just sports, as you remember from a previous video. So scholars debate the exact details of Constantine's conversion. They debate how and when he converted. They debate perhaps his motivations in converting, why he converted. Was this sincerely held spiritual beliefs or was it an attempt to consolidate power and gain Christian support? Um, they also debate his actual beliefs as a Christian. Some scholars think that um, he may have followed what was called the Arian heresy. The Arian heresy, um, it's considered to be not orthodox outside of Christianity. It's considered to be uh, not a mainstream Christian belief, but it was much more common in the, the 300s. And the Arians believed that uh, Jesus was created by God after creation. And uh, Christian Orthodox teaching today teaches that uh, Jesus had always existed spiritually and then was incarnated or made human by God, being born then as a human sometime between 8 and 4 uh, BCE. And Constantine, even if he was an Arian, which is debatable, some people think he may have been an Arian because he was baptized by uh, an Arian uh, cleric, an Arian um, uh, bishop. Um, but he called what was called the Council of Nicaea, which was a, uh, a religious council that upheld what is called Nicaean Christianity, the belief that uh, Jesus had always existed spiritually and then was incarnated and was made a human by God. And that's the, the belief that uh, is considered to be Christian orthodoxy today. So. He's a very controversial and very complex figure. Um, he does some good things as, as emperor and some bad things. We'll talk about both the good and the bad in the coming slides. Um, and we even debate 
how Christian was Constantine? Was he a very sincere Christian who understood the faith very well? Or was he someone who didn't really understand Christianity uh, and chose Christianity more to gain power? Uh, scholars, theologians, archaeologists will debate these things. But we can agree, though, we can all agree that Constantine's decision um, to pronounce his Christianity um, to the world um, with his um, declarations uh, and, and decorating uh, his troops' uh, weapons and things with uh, these, these symbols, and then his Edict of Milan, his temporary banning of gladiatorial games, they will take Roman culture in a much more uh, Christian direction. And eventually it will mean to be a Roman, you will have to be a Christian. So even though as Constantine is changing Roman culture, he's actually in some ways, he's still fairly, you might say, conservative as well. Um, in how he chooses to have himself represented. This um, image on this slide is a um, head of Constantine from what is called the Colossus of Constantine. It's a, it would have been when it was still put together, a massive uh, 12 uh, meter high or 40 feet high uh, statue. Uh, and it's made in, I would argue, a combination of the late antiquity, expressive abstract style and very large expressive eyes, but then Constantine is represented in what I would say is an older um, classical Augustan portrait style. He has um, a narrow face. He's clean shaven without a beard. This is more of a style in the early Roman Empire. Uh, em Roman emperors later, from like the 100s to before Constantine, they like to have beards. But he's going back to kind of the older Augustan style um, in, in how he chooses to represent himself. So even though in many ways he's changing Roman society, he's also hearkening back to an older period in Roman history as well. This is very interesting because another famous Christian emperor, Theodosius I, um, talked about earlier on this slide, even as he actually makes Christianity the state religion, um, he will um, encourage and actually make it the law that Roman um, elites have to wear togas, for example. So even though these Christian emperors are changing and, and redefining Roman culture, they're still adhering to many elements of older uh, Roman culture, uh, bringing back the clean shaven uh, you know, style, um, making togas, uh, making it the law that you have to wear togas in certain circumstances. But with this discussion uh, of Constantine's faith, his beliefs in mind, we'll continue our discussion with the, um, Constantine's rise to power and the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And this is the uh, Battle of Milvian Bridge. Um, Constantine was uh, moving towards uh, Rome, but he was stopped by the Tiber River. Uh, Maxentius was on the other side of the river and had destroyed the bridge. But then, mysteriously, uh, Maxentius decided to build a pontoon bridge to attack Constantine's forces. And um, his forces were... Um, being that they were on offense, they had a much more difficult time fighting. And they were defeated, and they were forced to retreat across the pontoon bridge, which eventually sunk. And it was a massive defeat for Maxentius that led to Constantine becoming the Roman emperor. And of course, uh, Maxentius had probably more troops than Constantine. He had support from the Praetorian Guard. He was on defense. He could have forced... Constantine to attack him across the Tiber River, yet for some reason he chose to attack and give up his uh, tactical advantages, um, which some might argue um, is because uh, Constantine was uh, divinely blessed because he had taken the symbol of Christ and put it on his soldiers' shields. Uh, Constantine, by the way, was supported by um, legions from the northern part of the Roman Empire. Um, Constantine was born in what is now Serbia, and then he spent a lot of his young life actually in, uh, in Britain, in Britannia. So he was a man definitely of the northern parts of the, North, of the Roman Empire. Yet he makes Christianity a um, eastern, a southeastern religion, his uh, religion of choice. Here are some examples of the Cairo symbol on Roman iconography. 
the image on the left is a silver medallion featuring uh, Constantine. It's from about 315 to 316 CE. And if you look uh, closely, uh, you can see that um, the Cairo symbol is actually on the front of the crest of Constantine's helmet. Documentary sources mention that Constantine liked to wear uh, helmets and headwear with the Cairo symbol. Uh, we also um, we, we believe that Constantine put the Cairo symbol on other elements of uh, military uh, equipment. Uh, shields. Uh, you can see uh, on the shield here, you can see the, the Cairo symbol here as well. This piece is well, it's a drawing actually of an artifact called the Kirch shield um, that was found in the 1890s in um, what is now the Crimea region. And uh, we think it shows um, Constantius II, the son of Constantine, and we see uh, him uh, accompanied by a soldier with a shield with the Cairo symbol. So you can see that um, Constantine, he becomes a Christian. He passes the Edict of Milan. He takes Roman culture in a more Christian direction. And seeing the Cairo symbol on um, um, Roman uh, military equipment, it's a sign that uh, the Roman Empire is becoming Christian, that Christian culture is becoming Roman culture. In addition to Christian symbols like Cairo becoming part of Roman imperial iconography, Christianity becoming uh, legal under the Edict of Milan, Christianity is becoming part of Roman culture in other ways. It's becoming institutionalized and a part of the Roman dominant culture in other ways. One way that uh, Christianity is becoming more a part of the Roman culture is through uh, monasticism. Uh, now, monasticism started out in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, in places like Egypt and the Middle East. Uh, men who were interested in Christianity, uh, who followed the Christian faith, fled out into deserts and uh, secluded areas. Uh, they were probably copying biblical figures, uh, prophets, people like John the Baptist, for example, and they were probably also copying uh, Greco-Roman thinkers and uh, or Greco-Roman uh, Jewish thinkers like uh, Philo of Alexandria. Remember, Philo of Alexandria was uh, a uh, Jewish person who was very interested in Greco-Roman culture and made a Greek translation of the, the Jewish Bible. And these men will become the first monks. They will be the founders of monasticism. And in the beginning, they're really, they're hermits. Uh, they live out alone by themselves in the desert. Um, they are trying to be like prophets, trying to be like other philosophers who dedicate their life to uh, thinking deeply and to scholarship. They may also have fled out to the desert because they were trying to avoid persecution as well. And their primary focus out in the desert is meditation and study. Initially, they would have been hermits, people like St. Anthony. Um, they would have lived by themselves. But over time, these isolated hermits began to live together and to create small communities of scholars and devotees. Um, study was their focus. Service, uh, serving the community like later monks would do, was more of a secondary position in their lives. You'll see that service, um, monastic service, uh, that is monks serving the Christian community, that's going to become much more of a thing in the 500s C and later in, in the Western parts of what used to be the Western Roman Empire. We're talking about the East right now, and this is late 200s and uh, in the 300s CE. And St. Anthony is, is one of the most important of these early uh, hermit monk figures in the eastern part of the uh, Roman Empire. Monasticism will develop a little bit later in the West, and its focus will be a little bit different. There will still be scholarship being done by monks in the West, but they're going to be more interested in uh, service as well in addition to scholarship. And the images on this slide, uh, the right-hand image is a uh, painting of St. Anthony from the uh, 17th century. It's interesting, uh, St. Anthony was of uh, Coptic descent. He probably didn't speak Greek, so uh, 
he's probably the basically a uh, Egyptian person and um, on uh, the center and left hand side of the slide this is uh, what is called Alavra. It's basically a proto monastery. It was found in Egypt. This one um, it dates to the fourth to eighth century uh, CE. There is writing in Greek uh, in this uh, Lavra showing its uh, focus on scholarship. And these Lavra proto monasteries probably evolved out of the uh, huts that hermits would have lived in. They would have begun building their huts closer together and those would have over time become these uh, proto monasteries and this is the beginnings of eastern monasticism within christianity um, the western monasticism is going to take off a little bit later but either way the development of monasticism is showing that christianity is becoming a part of and mixing with greco-roman culture uh, in the uh, 300s and beyond One more piece of evidence of the Christianization of the Roman civilization is uh, St. Jerome's Vulgate. And St. Jerome was a scholar who studied Greek and Hebrew and the, the original languages that the, uh, the Bible was written in. And he will translate these languages. Uh, he will create a Latin Bible called the Vulgate. And this is a massive, very challenging project that's going to take him about 20 years to complete. You can see in this um, this uh, 17th century painting of St. Jerome, um, he's thin, he's emaciated, he's pictured with a skull. Um, the state of his body, uh, the skull, rep they represent self-sacrifice, dying to self, dying to produce this, uh, this Latin Bible, this Bible in the language of the Roman people. Now, the Roman people, a lot of them knew Greek, but Latin was the language of the Western part of the... Uh, the Roman Empire, and most Romans would not have known Hebrew, uh, the language of the Old Testament was written. And so um, the fact that there was a, a need for this document, uh, a Latin Bible, shows that not only uh, were Romans becoming Christian, Roman culture was being Christianized, but there were Roman people who wanted to learn about the Bible and read it for themselves in their own language. And Jerome's scholarship, his translation of the Bible, will inspire uh, later translations of the Bible, uh, especially the, the translations of the Bible that are going to be made during the Reformation. The people of the Reformation, they were using versions of, of St. Jerome's Vulgate, a Latin text. The people of, of Reformation era Europe, most could not speak Latin or read Latin, so they needed to have texts in their own language. And they looked to what St. Jerome did way back in uh, the late 300s and early 400s for inspiration. And uh, the uh, image on the right-hand side, side of the slide is it is the uh, oldest complete uh, Vulgate. It's, it's not from when uh, St. Jerome was alive. It's a copy of a copy of a copy, but it's the oldest uh, complete uh, Vulgate that we've found. It's from perhaps about the 700s uh, CE. So you can see uh, there's a lot of evidence that Christianity is melding with uh, Roman culture. Uh, the monks in the eastern part of the empire are studying Christian uh, teaching a lot like uh, the philosophers would have done, the Greco-Roman philosophers would have done. People like um, St. Augustine or Augustine, they are um, cr Christians, but they are looking at what's happening to Roman society and they're wondering why would God uh, judge and, and destroy uh, Roman society, which was uh, a Christian society by the time uh, Augustine was living? And then you have uh, St. Jerome's Vulgate, a translation of the Bible into uh, the Latin language, the language of the Roman people. And this is a um, rendering of what the original St. Peter's Basilica or St. Peter's Church would have looked like. It was built... Um, between 326 and 333 CE, it's in the Vatican. This church no longer uh, exists. It's been uh, rebuilt and remodeled uh, and renovated many times. It, it looks very different nowadays, but this is what the model of uh, the Western Roman Basilica Church would have looked like. A long, narrow uh, nave that 
congregants would have had to process downwards towards the uh, transept, which held the altar, the holy place. So here's a, a couple of points about re Western Roman Christian basilicas. Uh, Christians began to build uh, public churches in the 300s after Christianity was legalized. Um, these basilica churches were built in the style of Roman pagan temples uh, with uh, columns on the side like this, and then also with Roman uh, audience halls. So they're using points of reference, pagan temples and government buildings to build their churches to make it easier for pagan people to adopt Christianity. And of course, these are long rectangular buildings. Congregants must process down the nave, uh, approaching the transept and the altar. And this would have made it uh, a more familiar type of building to pagan Romans. Uh, at these uh, basilica churches, um, Christians would have gone to worship services, but they also would have venerated the saints. The saints were mostly uh, martyrs, early Christians who had been killed, and veneration of the saints would have reminded uh, a lot of pagan Romans of worshiping uh, the gods. So another point of reference that would have made uh, Christianity more appealing to non-Christian Romans. Also, you have to remember that these Christian Roman people, they lived in, grew up in, and in some cases had been pagans themselves. So as they're developing Christianity as a religion, not only are they trying to reach um, non-Christian Romans, but non-Christian Roman culture is also going to influence them. And a lot of these uh, Roman basilicas, they would be remodeled during the medieval and the Renaissance periods, as I mentioned before. And so there's really actually not many um, examples of Roman era basilicas that have not been heavily, heavily modified. One of the few examples of one that hasn't been changed a whole lot is the Basilica of St. Sabina. This is in Rome. It was built between 422 and 432 uh, CE. So it gives you an idea of what an original Roman Basilica might have looked like. This is the exterior of the Basilica of St. Sabina. You can see the stone and brickwork, um, characteristic of Roman architecture, tile roofs, um, Tile, of course, is uh, developed by the Greeks, but used by the Romans. And then, of course, you see the uh, Roman arches as well. And this part of the uh, building has uh, plaster on the exterior. The Romans like to cover uh, brick buildings with plaster and then paint over the plaster. Before we continue our discussion of early Christian architecture, I want to mention um, the Constantine Basilica in uh, Trier, Germany. This is a secular basilica. Basilicas were secular buildings where courts and other political um, business took place. And this um, political basilica was built um, by uh, Constant Constantius Chlorus and then Constantine. And it lacks um, interior columns, which a lot of other basilicas have. But it does have what um, is very interesting is a uh, hypocaust heating system to heat the walls and the floors. You know, Germany gets pretty cold in the winter, so the Romans would have wanted to use existing heating technology to make this building more comfortable. Eventually, it's going to be converted to a church. Um, but uh, this building was actually uh, badly damaged uh, during the Second World War. And there was a fire inside, which actually burned off a lot of the... Uh, decorations on the walls so you can see the original brick and the structure of the building so it's still actually used for religious services today uh, but it's a very interesting uh, architectural uh, site because it reveals sort of the interior of what a basilica would have looked like without its decorations and this basilica is not an ecclesiastical basilica or at least it wasn't built for the purpose of being a church. Um, it was converted into a church later, unlike the uh, basilica we looked at on the previous slide, which was built specifically to be a church. This is a Cairo symbol along with uh, Alpha and Omega. It's from the, uh, this is actually from the Lulling Stone Villa in Britain. Uh, this inscription or this image was probably made between the 300s and the 400s CE. Um, it's possible that this uh, image was meant to be a decoration to show the family's Christian faith, the family who lived in Lullingstone Villa, 
but it may have also been uh, put on the wall to um, basically make the Lullingstone Villa a house church. Um, other families may have come to the Lullingstone Villa to have church services, um, and this is why the Cairo symbol was, was added, like a cross in a modern day church. It's interesting though to see this Christian symbol in a villa in Britain on the far edges of the uh, Roman Empire. Because remember, uh, Christianity starts in the southeast of the Roman Empire and it grows fastest in urban areas. Some more of the uh, visual art of uh, the Lullingstone Villa and its allusions to Christianity. Um, there's mosaics of uh, Bellerophon killing the Chimera. This is a classical uh, pagan story but it may have been reinterpreted by Christian people to symbolize Christianity's triumph over paganism or um, basically the defeat of this chimera monster. What's also interesting is this is a very large and expensive mosaic. Um, it, see, it would seem based on material culture, the Lullingstone Villa residents, they were actually getting wealthier in the 300s and the 400s CE as a lot of other Romans were getting poorer, which a lot of scholars argue that um, even as poorer Romans uh, suffered, um, wealthier Romans did not really want to uh, help them anymore, which is why Christianity grew, because Christianity taught that you were supposed to help the poor. And Lullingstone Villa is believed to have some of the oldest uh, Christian symbols in, in Britain. And, you know, the fact that these images are being found in Britain on the edge of the Roman frontier, it shows that Christianity had spread really throughout the Roman Empire, even if it was more associated with urban centers and with the southeast of, of the civilization. And here's a, another image of the atrium mosaic of Lullingstone Villa. You can see the chimera fight up here. Down here is a um, image of uh, Jupiter or Jove um, kidnapping Europa, an important um, pagan Roman story. Uh, not the kind of story that um, Christians would like because it features kidnapping and uh, sexual violence, but um, yet it's, it's still a part of uh, the Lullingstone mosaic. Um, it's possible that maybe some of the uh, family members living at Lullingstone Villa still maintained their beliefs in paganism, or it's possible that the Lullingstone Villa uh, inhabitants were Christians, but they still believed or at least liked some of the old um, Greco-Roman stories like uh, Jove and Europa. There's also um, crosses. So it's possible that uh, these are Christian crosses or crosses of Christ. Uh, we don't know for sure because the Romans at this point usually did not symbolize Christianity with the cross. Once again, they would have seen the cross as a negative symbol. Uh, so there's some speculation that, that we have to make as archaeologists. Uh, there's also other, other symbols uh, in the, uh, the mosaic that would have had a very different meaning. These symbols would have meant good fortune. They did not have the negative connotations that they do to us today. And this is just the uh, model of the Lullingstone Villa. The uh, mosaic is in the atrium of, of the villa. And the atrium, of course, would have been a public space in the, the house. We've also found skeletal remains at the Lullingstone Villa site. Um, these were uh, remains that were um, placed in lead coffins and then uh, put in the ground. These were not cremated remains. Uh, Christianity uh, does not generally support cremation, uh, at least at this point in history. So the fact that these remains are inhumed, buried rather than burned, is a sign that at least some of the residents of Lullingstone Villa were adopting uh, Christianity, not only in how they decorated their home, but even in their burial rituals. And by the way, um, Lullingstone Villa was probably abandoned about 420 CE um, after it was burned down by a fire. Um, this is about 10 years after the Romans left uh, Britain for good. The Romans left in the, about the year 410. So now we'll discuss some of Constantine's other accomplishments. Uh, Constantine strengthened the faltering Roman monetary system 
by uh, putting a lot more gold coins into circulation. Um, we think that he got a lot of this gold from mining and melting down um, pagan statues. Basically, these temples became property of the Roman state, and a lot of them were uh, dismantled, even though at this point there were still a lot of pagans living in um, the Roman Empire. It's believed that about the 350s, uh, 350s CE is when Christianity became the majority re religion in the Roman Empire. Um, Constantine also reconquered um, territory that had been lost during the 200s crisis, including uh, Dacia. Dacia, of course, is in the Danube River Valley. It's roughly uh, modern day Romania. Uh, he also ruled as a single emperor of both the Western and Eastern Roman empires. And he's considered to be one of the, uh, generally one of the best Roman emperors. Um, and then he probably actually delayed the collapse of the Roman Empire by improving the monetary system, uh, by conquering or reconquering lost territory, and by um, beginning uh, religious toleration of Christians. And this image is of the uh, Arch of Constantine, it's in Rome. This is a reconstruction of what Constantinople or Byzantium would have looked like. Um, Constantine took the city of Byzantium, which was a Greek colony, and he turned it into what was supposed to be the new capital of the Roman Empire. Uh, and he, of course, it was named after Constantine. You can see some of the public works projects that were begun by Constantine. The original city would have been here, and then this all would have been added later. Um, and of course, the city grew even into medieval times and beyond. Um, this map, I think, is supposed to be from about the 1200s CE. So the original version of the city that Constantine would have known would have been probably to about here. And all of this would have been added much later. And this is um, Constantine's dedication of uh, Constantinople. Uh, it was made the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. But Constantine also ruled the Western Roman Empire. So for a brief period, it's actually the capital of both halves of the empire. But after Constantine's death, um, the empire is going to be uh, divided again. This is the aqueduct of Constantinople. It's the longest aqueduct in the Roman Empire. And we believe that it was still being used even hundreds of years later by the Byzantine Empire. So it shows how reliable that this aqueduct was in bringing water to the city of Constantinople. This is a part of the Hippodrome of Constantinople. The Hippodrome, of course, was a racetrack for chariot racing. Uh, Constantine had banned uh, gladiatorial contests, which made chariot racing a lot more important. And uh, it was the Hippodrome of Constantinople was expanded by Constantine in the 330s uh, CE. These are the uh, Baths of Constantine. They are in uh, Gaul, what is now France. They were built uh, sometime in the 300s uh, CE. They were probably built as part of a series of renovations and infrastructure projects because Constantine wanted to use this city um, as a administrative center for Gaul. And so building a new bathhouse and other new buildings would have helped Constantine show his power to the people of Gaul and that he uh, wanted to provide for them and be a good ruler. And this bathhouse features um, many hallmarks of uh, Roman baths, various pools for bathing, hot pools, cold pools, uh, exercise areas, etc. It also has a uh, hypocaust uh, heating system as well uh, so that the, the water can be made hot. Constantine had other bathhouses and infrastructure projects built throughout the empire. Probably the most famous uh, bathhouse or bath of Constantine um, is actually in or was in Rome. Unfortunately, that bathhouse um, was uh, demolished in the early 1600s to make way for another building, which is just one of the challenges of urban archaeology. Um, there's so little space. Um, stakeholders, people who live in the cities um, in later times often want to tear down older buildings so they can have space for new buildings, which certainly can make um, things very difficult for historians and archaeologists who want to study these buildings to learn more about the past. But 
um, these baths in, in, in France are still standing, so we can uh, study them to get an idea of what a bathhouse would have looked like in the uh, 300s. So now I want to talk about some of the uh, most important or the most standout Roman emperors that come after Constantine. I will begin this discussion by talking about um, Emperor Julian, also known as Julian the Apostate. Uh, Emperor Julian was a relative of Constantine. He was a nephew of Constantine. He lived from 331 to 363 CE. But his reign was very short, only from 361 to 363 CE. As emperor, uh, Julian uh, wanted to return the Roman Empire to his, its pagan roots. Um, Julian had been raised in a Christian home, but sometime in his young adulthood, he converted to paganism. He was inspired by uh, Greco-Roman pagan mythology and uh, Greek philosophy and felt that paganism was the right religion for, for him. And he believed that uh, returning the empire to its pagan roots and its pagan culture was the key to uh, ensuring the prosperity of, and security of the Roman Empire. He saw that the Roman Empire was changing, that uh, Roman culture was becoming increasingly Christianized after um, the uh, Edict of Milan, which made um, Christianity legal to practice. He witnessed the growth of the Christian population. Some scholars think that the Roman Empire actually had a Christian majority by the 350s. We don't know for sure. There's some speculation involved there. Uh, but Julian was probably especially concerned that Christians were beginning to really um, take over the Roman upper class, uh, the political classes, the wealthy elite. Um, he probably also looked at the power of the church and saw the power of the pope and the bishops as being a challenge to his own authority. So. He probably wanted to return the empire to its pagan roots, believed it was better for the empire to go back to the old ways. He probably was also alarmed at the growth of Christianity and the increasing power of the Christian elite in the, the Roman Empire. And he took certain measures to curtail the uh, growth of Christianity. This included things like barring uh, Christians from certain types of professions, including um, certain educational professions. He was worried that Christian people were going to educate students, but also convert them to Christianity, and he saw that as a threat to his authority as a uh, pagan Roman emperor. He also mandated that um, former pagan uh, religious property, things from pagan temples, they would have to be returned to the pagan temples. So um, a lot of this property had been um, taken and put in churches. He said the church had to give up that property and had to have it returned. So you might argue that some of the things that Julian is doing are a form of persecution against Christians, uh, barring them from certain professions, making them give back uh, pagan property. In some cases, this property may have been um, belong, having have, would have belonged to Christians for uh, decades at this point. You might argue this is a form of persecution, but it's certainly not the severe persecution that uh, the Christians were dealing with during like the reign of Diocletian, for example. Um, he even um, ordered, uh, rather bizarrely, that the uh, Jewish temple should be rebuilt. The Jewish temple had been destroyed in 79 CE by the Romans, not by Christians. But uh, we think there's a few reasons for why Julian would have wanted to rebuild this temple. Perhaps he was trying to get the support of Jewish people. He would have recognized that uh, Jews and Christians were increasingly enemies at this point and he may have wanted to have support uh, from Jews against Christians. Um, Julian also may have been interested in uh, the Christian God, um, the Jewish God. Well, Jewish people and Christian people uh, believe they worship the same God. Uh, the Jewish God is usually called Yahweh, as you'll remember from a previous video. Perhaps he was trying to get the support of Yahweh by rebuilding uh, the Jewish temple. There's also evidence that Julian was very interested in uh, Jewish religious practices, especially animal sacrifice. Typically, Jews made sacrifices of animals in the Jewish temple. They didn't make sacrifices of animals at the local synagogue. And with the destruction of the temple, those sacrifices and rituals had stopped. So 
He may have been trying to make an alliance with the Jews. He may have been trying to get the support of the Jewish God. The pagan Romans, although they worshipped the Greco-Roman pantheon, they worshipped gods from other cultures. They worshipped Mithras, a Persian god. Julian may have been trying to add Yahweh to the uh, Greco-Roman pagan pantheon. And then also there's speculation that perhaps he was having the temple rebuilt because he was trying to invalidate Christian prophecies about the destruction of the temple. That He was basically trying to prove Christianity wrong by having this temple rebuilt, a temple that... Um, Christian leaders like Jesus uh, said was going to be destroyed. And part of the pagan idea of uh, mixing of religions, of cultural syncretism, I think this also inf informs and inspires his religious toleration edict of 363 CE. This edict was probably passed um, based on uh, Julian's desire to have cultural syncretism, to mix various religious ideas together. It was also probably inspired to weaken, uh, weaken Christianity. Uh, Christianity is not a religion wherein you can add in multiple gods from multiple, multiple religions. Uh, they do have things like the veneration of saints, which is kind of similar to the worshiping of multiple gods, but Christianity is not a poly polytheistic religion. It is a monotheistic religion. So having this religious toleration, it's also going to undermine Christianity. In terms of um, Julian's other beliefs, besides his religious beliefs, he was a, uh, a lover of Greek philosophy, and he was a follower of Neoplatonist Greek philosophy, and he considered himself to be a philosopher. He uh, grew a philosopher's beard. Um, this is uh, in a time period where Roman men typically did not wear beards. They were uh, clean-shaven. He also, um, it was said that he wore uh, Greek-style clothing. This this modern statue uh, actually shows Julian in a Greek-style cloak, highlighting his affinity for uh, Greek philosophy. And Julian would talk about philosophy, and he would. Um, it was said that um, his speeches were very pedantic; they were very um, erudite, uh, a little bit hard for everyday Romans to understand. And it was said that on one occasion he gave a speech, and the crowd started mocking him because of his beard. Basically, they thought that having a beard was, was kind of like being a nerd. So uh, Julian's personal style, which was abrasive, combined with the fact that the culture of the Roman Empire was becoming increasingly Christian, um, these things keep um, his attempts to repaganize the empire from sticking, from lasting permanently. Christianity will continue to grow in power after uh, Julian's reign comes to an end. It will uh, become the state religion, and, and there's good evidence that uh, Christians would uh, basically go on to persecute uh, pagan people. But uh, Julian's reign is very short because he will die from a wound that he sustains during his campaign against uh, the Persians. And there's some controversy over whether he was wounded by a Persian soldier or perhaps wounded by one of his own troops. Uh, we don't know for sure. Perhaps it was a uh, soldier allied with the Persians who wounded him and that led to his death. Uh, it's a bit more speculative that perhaps one of his own troops wounded him, leading to his death. We don't know if that was perhaps an accident, if it was one of his own troops, or if it was a case of a disgruntled Christian soldier wanting to have revenge on Julian. Roman emperors have been killed by their own troops in the past. Uh, we don't know for sure. Either way, though, his reign is brief. He dies from a wound he sustains during the Persian campaign. And in retrospect, um, pagan historians tended to like Julian when they wrote about him. They thought that he was doing a good thing, that he was trying to get uh, the Roman Empire back to its roots. But Christian historians generally do not like or did not like Julian. They They thought that he was an apostate, um, that he was uh, turning his back on Christianity and that he was damaging the empire with his, um, his pagan policies. And the images on this slide, again, this is a uh, modern uh, statue of Julian uh, reflecting his um, philosophical style. And this is a, a gold coin showing uh, Julian with his philosopher's beard. This is a relief uh, celebrating uh, Shopper's defeat of Julian. Um, you can see uh, his body here is being stood over by uh, the king. 
and by uh, the Persian god Mithras and uh, Ahura Mazda, the god of Zoroastrianism. And this, this um, relief is in uh, present-day Iran. Another important um, Roman emperor post-Constantine was Theodosius I, also known as Theodosius the Great. He ruled from 379 to 395 CE, and he is the last uh, Roman em emperor to rule um, a combined uh, unified Roman Empire. Remember, Constantine unified the Roman Emp Empire. After Theodosius I, what's left of the Roman civilization is always going to be divided um, between the East and the West. Um, under Theodosius Nicene, or Trinitarian Christianity, um, that is Christianity where uh, Jesus is believed to have been a spiritual being um, who has existed for all time, but then became a human um, between 4 BCE and 33 CE. Um, that became the orthodoxy uh, of Christianity. It was laid down at the Council of Nicaea. That's where it gets the term uh, Nicene. And this becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire. This angers a lot of pagans, especially um, the Senate. A lot of the senators were still pagan. And a lot of wealthy people in rural areas um, were still kind of clinging on to Christianity. In fact, the term uh, pagan comes from paganus, uh, which is Latin for a a country person or a rustic. It's actually kind of a uh, pejorative term uh, in, in Latin. So as Roman society became uh, more Christian, uh, scholars generally think that uh, Christianity became the majority religion by about the 350s. Um, a lot of uh, Roman gender norms changed in some ways. Um, for example, sex outside of marriage, um, was uh, increasingly taboo. In, in pre-Christian Roman society, men were generally permitted to have sex outside of marriage, but women were not. In Christian Roman society, sex for both men and women outside of marriage became uh, a sinful act. Also, divorce became a sinful act as well. Um, in pre-Christian Rome, men could initiate divorces, but women could not. Uh, now, in, in Christian Rome, it became a sinful thing for anyone to try to initiate a divorce. There were also more laws that controlled uh, prostitution and sex work as well, because remember, sex outside of marriage was seen as being a sinful act, according to Christians. So in some ways, sex and sexuality were more controlled, but in other ways, they were also equalized. Men had lost a lot of the sexual privileges they'd been permitted to have during pagan times, uh, and they had basically a lot of the same rules that women had to live by. So even though Christianity is a, a patriarchal religion, in some ways, it equalized relations between uh, men and women in, in, in the Roman civilization. Uh, what's interesting, though, is even as Theodosius I is making all these changes, making Christianity the official religion of Roman society, he actually, in some ways, maintained a lot of um, older, uh, might, you might say, conservative Roman styles. For example, his, his busts are usually portrayed in a much more uh, portrait-like style, as opposed to the expressive, abstract, late antiquity style. Also, um, even though he was opposed to paganism and opposed to many elements of older Roman culture, he, he made a law that said that senators had to wear togas when they were in the Senate and on official business. Uh, he didn't like the fact that the senators were wearing tunics and trousers. Um, we also think that Theodosius was trying to replace um, the old Roman systems of patronage um, and obligation with uh, Christian traditions of charity and benevolence for the poor. Um, he knew that these systems of patronage were breaking down, and he may have wanted um, wealthy Christians to instead sort of step up and take care of the poor the way uh, patrons had taken care of uh, clients in, in you know, centuries before. In, in the end, Theodosius I is generally seen as being one of the, the better uh, late Roman em emperors, although he has been criticized for making Christianity the state religion. Um, not only did he make Christianity the state religion, but he also um, uh, persecuted uh, non-Christian peoples. He banned the Olympic Games in 393 CE, for example. Um, the Romans before this, you know, when they were pagan, it allowed all religions to exist so long as those religions also worship the emperor. 
Uh, for Christianity, though, it's Christianity or, or nothing else. So he's criticized for making Christianity a state religion. And somebody's all, sometimes he's also criticized for um, massacring rioters in Thessalonica in uh, 390 CE. So he's generally seen as being a, a, a better emperor, but he was still uh, imperfect. These are uh, the columns of San Lorenzo, um, taken from a pagan temple sometime in the 300s CE. A lot of pagan temples were demolished from the time of Constantine through the time of Theodosius. And so um, rather than just destroying everything, the Romans would take pieces of, of these temples, you know, like these you know, beautiful Corinthian uh, columns, and they would recycle them into other buildings. These columns were actually built around a uh, church in uh, uh, Milan. Our next point will be a discussion of the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And we're not gonna talk about every single um, um, barbarian so-called um, group that fought with the Romans, that um, occupied Roman territory. We'll just talk about some of the uh, most important uh, barbarian invasions and barbarian uh, leaders. For context, in uh, the 300s and the 400s, Germanic tribes will be invading and migrating into uh, Roman territory, especially in the Western Roman Empire. There will be some migrations and invasions in the East as well, but uh, those invasions and migrations uh, don't seem to have been as disruptive as the ones in the West were, uh, probably because the Eastern Empire was able to uh, better fend off barbarian invasions, and in some cases able to placate and basically pay off uh, barbarians in a way that the West just could not do. Uh, for context, this, this painting is actually a, uh, it's a modern uh, painting, probably from the 1920s, showing Ulrich the Visigoth um, entering Athens in 395 CE. Ulrich uh, invaded the eastern part of the empire in Greece, but then he also invaded the, the West as well. And we think one of the reasons why he invaded the West was because basically the Eastern Romans paid him off to have him go invade the West instead. So even though the Eastern and Western Roman Empire should be working together, the East is kind of making things more difficult for the West. And over time, Rome was losing the ability to fight off uh, these uh, tribes of people that were encroaching on Roman territory. Um, and, and trying to settle in the empire. Um, some of these um, people served directly in the Roman uh, military. They saw there was an opportunity for um, service in the Roman military, but over time, because Roman military officers and leaders often did not treat their Germanic barbarian soldiers very well, more and more uh, Germanic people, if they're going to try to help Rome, they're gonna do so as uh, foiderati, keeping more of their Germanic cultural traditions, serving under uh, Germanic officers and being more like allied troops who are being paid to defend Rome and they'll fight against other barbarians. But oftentimes these, these foiderati will get frustrated with the Romans and they will turn on the Romans because the Romans are not treating them well, not paying them enough, etc. Ulrich the Visigoth himself had been a, um, he had, had spent some time in the Roman army and he also was a leader of Foiderati as well. And he was snubbed by a Roman emperor, which is one of the reasons why he turned on the Romans after having been an ally and fighting on their behalf. He will fight in the East, but he eventually will go and sack Rome in uh, 410 CE. It would seem one of the reasons that Ulrich was sort of looked down upon by um, Roman emperors and elite Romans was because of his uh, Germanic heritage. Even though he had um, basically been an ally of the Romans, he was uh, probably mistreated by them and looked down upon by, by ethnic, ethnic Romans. And so he will sack Rome. His troops will um, pillage uh, places like the tomb of Augustus. There's also evidence that they may have even uh, pillaged Christian catacombs as well. Although Ulrich was actually a Christian, a lot of the troops fighting under Ulrich would have been uh, Germanic pagans, so they wouldn't have had, not only would they not have had much of an interest in Roman culture, they would not have had much of an interest in Christianity. But Ulrich and his troops will sack the city, 
and they will actually take non-Roman slaves out of the city. A lot of these slaves might have been Germanic people, people who were not ethnically Roman, who were mistreated by their, their Roman slave owners. And uh, Ulrich took them into his, into his military. And we think actually uh, slaves basically changing their allegiance from the Romans to invading barbarians contributed to the fall of the empire. Um, the Romans, after Ulrich had sacked the city, they said, you've taken everything from us. You've taken our slaves. You've taken our gold, our silver. You've wrecked our city. You've left us with nothing. And Ulrich said, no, I've left you with your lives. Another reason that um, Germanic peoples would have wanted to migrate in, into and invade Roman territory would have been um, not just the the pull factors luring them into, into Roman territory, the weakness of the Roman Empire, its need for um, uh, additional troops, uh, and things like that. But also there's push factors, things pushing them out of their lands in northern Europe. And probably the biggest push factor is another um, uh, group of, of barbarians, as the Romans would have called them, called the Huns. And the Huns were a um, Central Asian, semi-nomadic equestrian culture that had been migrating um, from the east um, in the 300s and 400s, and they were uh, pushing the Germanic peoples out of uh, territories in Northern Europe. The most famous Hun leader uh, would have been Attila the Hun, uh, who we'll talk about a little bit more uh, later. And he will invade the Western Empire himself from 449 to 453 CE. Um, and he actually was going to sack and destroy Rome but then um, the Pope, actually, Pope Leo I, goes to Attila and begs him not to uh, destroy the city. And this is in 452. Attila will then not destroy Rome, but eventually Attila will die and his invasion of, of Rome will end. Rome will be again sacked by the Vandals um, under um, Genseric. This is in 455 uh, CE. And Genseric um, was a Vandal. He was a Germanic uh, person. Um, he will also sack territory in North Africa, where he will make alliances with local uh, African people um, who are not um, ethnically Roman. And these North African people and African people will join the Vandals and they will sack Rome in the 450s. And they'll do a lot of damage to Roman uh, buildings and infrastructure. This is where we get the term Vandal or vandalism in, uh, in English from. We get it from uh, the Vandals. And these sackings of Rome were demoralizing for the people, the Roman people. Um, but Rome's population had been going down for many years. Its prominence as a city had been in decline for over a century. Uh, Rome was not the capital any, anymore. The capital uh, first was, was Milan after Rome in 286 and then Ravenna in 482. So the sackings of Rome, they're certainly a blow to Roman culture, but it's not nearly as devastating of a thing as it would have been if Rome had been captured in uh, the 100s or 200s CE. This is uh, an image of the Vandals attack on Rome. Uh, the Vandals attacked uh, Rome in the 450s CE. Uh, you can see uh, Germanic Vandals are also uh, joined by presumably um, African uh, soldiers that have been recruited in North Africa. The Vandals attacked uh, from North Africa, even though they were originally from uh, Germanic regions. This is a uh, relief showing Flavius uh, Stilicho, a Roman military officer and rival of Ulrich the Visigoth. Um, he leads Roman troops and uh, Federati against um, Ulrich, um, who is trying to invade Western Roman territory. And Stilicho was of Germanic and uh, Roman origin and had climbed the ranks in, in the Roman military. In spite of his uh, Germanic background, the Romans seem to have really trusted him, uh, allowing him to obviously reach that rank. Uh, Stilicho is married to Serena, the daughter of uh, former Roman Emperor Theodosius, and he's even the, um, the basically the regent of uh, the current Roman Emperor Honorius. So they have a lot of confidence in, in Stilicho, and 
one of the reasons they have so much confidence in Stilicho is because uh, of his military successes, his uh, defeats uh, of Alric, the, the Visigoth. Unfortunately, though, there were some palace intrigues, and it was rumored that uh, Stilicho planned to depose Honorius and replace Honorius with Eucherius, his own son, as the emperor. And because of this, uh, Stilicho is going to be killed. And with the death of Stilicho, the Romans, they lose one of their most capable military commanders who's defeating a very important enemy, Ulrich the Visigoth. Also, after Stilicho's death, the Romans basically go and they turn on um, the uh, Germanic Foiderati in Italia. And so not only do they lose a important commander, they lose a large part of their military. And that basically sets up the scene for Ulrich's invasion of uh, the Italian peninsula. There's fewer uh, troops to defend Italia because these uh, Foiderati have been killed. And those that do survive will actually turn on the Romans, understandably so, and will join Ulrich the Visigoth. And the Visigoths are not the only Germanic people to attack uh, the Italian peninsula and to sack Rome. Other groups like the Vandals will also um, attack and, and, and sack Rome. So the uh, German uh, Foiderati are playing a major role in the Roman military, um, even as uh, Germanic peoples are fighting against Rome. Uh, and Roman culture, even though they're relying on the, the, these Germanic Foiderati, um, they still in many ways look down on Germanic people, seeing them as barbarians, as, as beneath them. And I think in order to better understand why the Romans um, saw the Germanic peoples the way they did, we have to discuss who the Germanic people were in a little bit more detail. And the Germanic people, um, they come from Northern Europe. They are um, descendants of uh, the Indo-European uh, migrants, uh, just like the Celts. The Romans and the Greeks also have Indo-European ancestry, at least in part. The Germanic people uh, have uh, more uh, close, uh, more a more close genetic relationship to the Indo-Europeans than, than the Greeks and the Romans do. Um, and the Germanic people, they come from Northern Europe. They begin migrating um, out of Scandinavia. Remember, the Indo-Europeans, they come from uh, the Pontic Steppes, what is now um, sort of the Ukraine-Russia region. They will settle in Scandinavia, then they'll work their way back down south into what is now uh, Germany. And a Germanic culture, I think, is recognizable in terms of things like language, in terms of artifacts, between the 750s and 500s BCE. So this is going back uh, over a thousand years before the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And the Romans will observe the Germanic people across time. Julius Caesar will write about them, uh, emperor, um, scholars like Tacitus will write about them, and the Romans really exoticized Germanic people. They recognized they were very strong, very capable warriors. Uh, they often um, romanticized the Germanic people in some ways. Even as they viewed them as inferior, they kind of romanticized the German people as being very strong, uh, very sober, but less civilized than Romans. It's sort of what's often called a version of the noble savage uh, motif. Uh, you see the noble savage motif in, in a lot of American writings about, uh, like Native Americans, for example, that uh, Native Americans are, are uh, less civilized than, than, than Euro-Americans, but they're also uh, more pure and more uh, noble than, than uh, Euro-white uh, Americans. In terms of their culture, the Germanic culture is actually fairly similar to the Celtic culture that we talked about previously in this course. Uh, the Germanic people are not a single empire. They're, um, well, they have certain cultural similarities. They would not have thought of themselves as being a single uh, people. Not at this point in history. This is over a thousand years before uh, the modern nation state of Germany is developed in the, uh, the 1800s. Instead, they were uh, divided into various sort of tribes or, or uh, chiefdoms. 
There's groups like the Alemanni, the Franks, the Goths, the Vandals, the Saxons, etc. And then there's sort of groups within those uh, within those tribes or smaller factions. It's a much more decentralized culture. And there's going to be mixing with Romans and other groups of people. There's evidence of trade between Germanic people and Romans and Greeks. And certainly some Germanic people will fight on the Roman side and in wars. Other Germanic people will fight against the Romans. And sometimes Germanic people will switch sides if they're being mistreated by the Romans. And this is possible because the governments of these uh, tribes and factions are more decentralized. Basically, sort of chieftains or warlords would rule with the help of councils called things in which uh, men would gather together and they would decide what to do. Uh, they would talk uh, together. And you see uh, things in many different Germanic cultures. Later uh, Germanic cultures like the Norse culture, Scandinavian culture, uh, a civilization associated with the Vikings, they will have uh, things where they enforce their laws and they talk together. It's a much more decentralized way of governing things. And the Germanic peoples, when they um, lived as uh, Foiderati, uh, they, they tried to have a governmental system more like the thing than the very centralized Roman government, which is based around uh, the emperor and then civil law. Also, um, Germanic society is very militaristic, uh, as observed by the Romans, and the material culture we find certainly backs that up. It's a patriarchal society in which uh, men are the rulers, they are the, uh, uh, the fighters, um, they are the warriors. Women uh, will oversee the home and the domestic space. Um, it's debatable as to whether Germanic society uh, was more or less patriarchal than like Greco-Roman society. I would argue though, on the whole, that even though it is a patriarchal society, there's more opportunities for women in the Germanic uh, culture than there are for, for Roman women. And the Germanic people, like the Romans, they also practiced slavery. And scholars debate uh, which slavery was worse or better. Uh, I think they generally argue that uh, slavery amongst Germanic peoples was, was not as bad as slavery amongst the Romans. The Indo-European uh, uh, religious traditions are very element evident in Germanic culture. Uh, they worship gods uh, like uh, Wotan, also known as Odin. Uh, Thor, uh, and Tyr, also known as Tu, and uh, Freya, and these gods are very similar to the Greco-Roman Roman pantheon. Um, the Greco-Roman uh, god Zeus or Jupiter has elements of, of Wotan or Odin, but also some elements of, of Tyr or Tu. Um, Tyr is a, a war god and could also be compared to uh, Ares or Mars. You also might compare um, like Zeus or Jupiter to Thor as well. And Freya can uh, be compared uh, to Aphrodite or Venus. Interestingly though, Tastus actually compares Odin uh, to Mercury or Hermes, the messenger god, which is rather unusual, but that's, that's the comparison Tacitus made. Um, some Germanic people will become Christians, uh, although they tend to be Aryan Christians as opposed to Nicene Christians. Economically, the um, Germanic people will practice agriculture, but their lifestyle is, is uh, less sedentary than that of the Romans. They do have decent sized population centers, but you don't see large Germanic cities at this point in history. They try to be a bit more mobile, even though they do practice some agriculture, but they're also very skilled metal workers, uh, weavers, and certainly skilled warriors, a lot like the Celts. They have extensive trade networks. Uh, they're trading with uh, other, other people, other cultures. Their burial rituals, like their religious rituals, there's some similarities between uh, uh, other Indo-European uh, people like the Celts. They build burial mounds. Um, they often bury their dead with possessions. They also bury people in bogs. Um, this was either a form of human sacrifice or it was done with criminals um, after they'd been executed. And Germanic culture lives on for a long period of time, 750s BCE, uh, well into, you might say, as late as 1000 CE, you know, when uh, the, the Vikings or the Norse people become Christian and then their culture 
changes and becomes more like the other kind of medieval European cultures. So I'm painting in very broad strokes here. I'm, I'm sort of mentioning some general trends within uh, Germanic culture, things that Romans would have witnessed across time that would have led them to recognize that Germanic people were had a different culture than them and would have contributed to the animosity that, that Romans had uh, towards Germanic people. Also, a lot of the documentary evidence we have um, about Germanic people, it's written uh, in the sagas and eddas. Uh, these are uh, basically like epic poems, but they are uh, legendary sources. They mix kind of myth, uh, mythical events, similar to like the Iliad and the Odyssey. They're also written in many cases hundreds of years after the events they're describing. And of course, there's Roman sources and Roman sources are often very biased against uh, Germanic people in many ways. We'll talk a bit more about Germanic uh, culture and um, archaeological evidence we have of Germanic culture on the next coming slides. This is an example of a um, Germanic burial mound. It's the Sutton Hu burial mound, or one of several uh, burial mounds at the Sutton Hu site in southeast England. They're made uh, during the 500s to 600s. Uh, CE, so after the Western Roman Empire has fallen, but uh, you'll find mounds like this uh, across history. There, there is quite a bit of continuity in uh, Germanic uh, cultures across time and across space. And this is also the very famous Sutton Hu helmet. It's probably more of a ceremonial helmet than an actual helmet that would have been worn in combat, but. Uh, the Germanic people, like the Celtic people, they liked to bury their wealthy elite dead uh, with possessions um, that they could use in the afterlife, and this would have shown the social stratification of Germanic society. I would say Germanic society was less socially stratified than the Roman society, but there's still evidence of social stratification. But we'll talk about uh, some of the more controversial uh, burials uh, that uh, Germanic people made. Specifically, we'll talk about uh, some of the uh, bog mummies on uh, the next couple of slides. Like the Celtic people, uh, the Germanic people um, buried some of their dead in bogs. Uh, we think they probably buried their dead in bogs for similar reasons. We think it may have been a form of uh, human sacrifice and also perhaps a way to deal with criminals, bury them in these bogs. Um, these people were not buried alive, they were uh, killed first and then buried. Uh, this is uh, the Tallinn man who um, lived and died sometime between uh, 405 and 380 BCE. Uh, he was probably a young man um, in his 20s, possibly as late as his 40s when he died. Um, he was buried post-mortem in, in what is now uh, Denmark. He would have been uh, hanged. Um, what's left of the noose can still be seen. Uh, can still be seen, so he would have uh, been hanged before um, he was buried in the bog. And we think that he was killed as part of some kind of sacrifice ritual. And we found both male and uh, female bodies. We think that they may have been sacrificed, but they may have also been people who had committed crimes and they were being buried in the bog. Um, rather than having a uh, nice burial mound. And these bodies are naturally mummified by uh, peat bogs. Um, the peat is uh, very acidic. It also locks out uh, oxygen and um, preserves these bodies very well. The Tallinn man, you can see, um, if you look very closely, you can see um, the beginnings of a beard, perhaps he hadn't had a, a chance to shave before uh, the day he was killed. Uh, you can see um, the uh, sort of a hat he's wearing as well. So you get an idea of some of the fashion and styles used by uh, Germanic peoples. Granted, this body, uh, th this person would have lived in the 400s BCE, late 300s BCE. That's a long time before uh, the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 400s CE. But we can still learn a little bit about later Germanic cultures by studying earlier Germanic cultures. And we study these bodies, we can learn a lot about what uh, Germanic people were eating, what their diet was like, what their health was. We can even learn something about the clothing they were wearing. 
some of their fashion styles. So finding these uh, uh, bog uh, bodies, these, these mummified remains in the bog, helps us learn a lot about uh, the Germanic people. This is another um, example of uh, human remains found in the bog. It's not as well preserved as the Tallinn man. It's basically the skull of what's called the Osterby man. And he was found in what is now Germany, and he probably lived sometime between the 70s and 130s uh, CE. We think that he was probably older when he, when he uh, died or was killed. We don't exactly know. Uh, his remains are not as well preserved. Uh, based on the wear on his jaws, he was probably an older man. And he was probably either beheaded or bludgeoned to death before he was cast into the bog, possibly both. Perhaps he was a criminal being executed, or perhaps he was a, sac a, a sacrificial victim. We don't know for sure. But this is a very interesting, um, certainly, um, very interesting skull because it still has hair attached. We can see uh, a Germanic uh, man's hairstyle. It's a um, basically a braid or a knot on one side to keep the hair out of, would have kept the hair out of his face when he was alive. Uh, this is called the Swabian knot. It's believed it was worn by a group of people called the Swaby, uh, a Germanic uh, tribe or chieftaincy. Um, documentary uh, sources written by Romans write that Germanic men often wore their hair in braids like this. They typically wore their hair long. Uh, and that braids like this would have varied somewhat uh, depending on what tribe or chieftaincy you were in. And it would have shown uh, your allegiance, almost like a, like a military uniform. So it's a very interesting um, archaeological find uh, for that reason. It helps us understand uh, fashion and allegiance in Germanic cultures. Here is some information about the Germanic religion. Um, we mentioned some of the gods earlier. Uh, Odin, Thor, Tyr uh, are more well-known um, deities um, along with uh, Freya as well. There's other other uh, gods and goddesses within the uh, Germanic pantheon, and it's a um, a religion of Indo-European inspiration. Um, it's I think pretty similar to the Celtic religion, a little bit different from the Greco-Roman religion, but there's certainly some similarities between the Greco-Roman pantheon and the Germanic pantheon. And this piece here is a um, a golden pendant from about the 400s or 500s CE, so about the time that the Western Roman Empire is collapsing. And it's found, or it was found, in what is now Denmark. And it has what appear to be um, a runic script. Uh, the Germanic people will develop uh, a rune alphabet uh, between the 1st and 2nd centuries CE. These are some Roman representations of Germanic people. Um, on the left-hand side of... This slide is a uh, thing council, probably actually the oldest portrayal of a Germanic thing council. And this is from the uh, Marcus Aurelius column. It's kind of hard to see on the original. It's been damaged, but this is a, uh, a drawing of what it would have looked like uh, at the time of the Roman Empire. And on this side of the slide is a representation of... Uh, Germanic uh, auxiliaries fighting alongside the Romans. Because remember, some Germanic peoples fought with the Romans and some fought against the Romans. But it gives an idea of, of how uh, these people would have looked, some of their fashion, what they would have worn in combat, that they uh, wore less clothing, just uh, trousers, and then had shields and uh, other weapons like swords. They were uh, certainly more lightly armed in combat than the average Roman legionary was, which certainly would have made them a lot more mobile. Although I suspect that high-ranking Germanic uh, like officers, chieftains, they would have worn more armor than the average rank-and-file uh, Germanic warrior. Here are some representations of uh, Germanic fashion. And it's important to talk about clothing and fashion because clothing is going to be a reflection of culture. The kind of uh, sartorial choices, clothing choices that people make will reflect their religious beliefs, their cultural and their social beliefs. On the uh, right-hand side of the slide, it's a uh, modern depiction of Germanic people's clothing from about the uh, fifth century or the 400s CE. Uh, the uh, male uh, German is wearing a cloak, 
with a long tunic uh, with long sleeves and trousers. Very similar to um, the kind of garb that uh, Roman men are wearing, highlighting the kind of cross-pollination of ideas, the spreading of Germanic fashion choices to uh, Romans in late antiquity as uh, m more Germanic people are entering the Roman military, they're spreading some of their fashion choices to Roman people. Uh, as far as uh, Roman women's clothing or Germanic women's clothing, um, this slide uh, shows that uh, Germanic women's clothing, it's a bit uh, more revealing than the kind of clothing being worn by uh, Roman women. Um, you see a, a deeper um, neckline, for example, this statue here is of a female Germanic captive thought to be Thusnelda, the spouse of Arminius. Arminius, remember, he was the, uh, a German who trained in the Roman military and then led Germanic people against uh, the Romans at the Teutoburg Forest way back during the reign of Augustus Caesar. This, this statue is from later, uh, but it, I think it's worth studying. It shows uh, a Germanic woman wearing more revealing clothing than what a uh, Roman woman, woman would have worn. Um, one breast is exposed. Um, the way that the sculptor has chosen to portray her body, I think, is significant as well. He's showing uh, this woman in a more full-figured way. Um, she has larger, perhaps more muscular arms uh, than a lot of Roman women are shown as having, and she's portrayed with larger breasts as well. The Romans, uh, their beauty standards were for actually the women ha for to have uh, small breasts. So perhaps they're trying to show the differences between Germanic women and Roman women. The R Germanic women are bigger, uh, stronger, perhaps more voluptuous, um, perhaps more sexual than Roman women. Uh, it could fit into the the uh, the Roman idea that the uh, Germanic people are are barbarians who can't control themselves, but are also somehow more noble and, and live closer to nature than Romans. That also might be highlighted by her hairstyle, which is a lot looser than the hairstyles you see on, on Roman women who wear very complex hairstyles. They wear their hair up, they wear it uh, in, in braids or in, um, in curls and things like that. At least they were uh, during the second century. So now we should discuss uh, the Huns, who they were uh, and what they, uh, what they did. Roman documentary sources describe the Huns as having uh, what we might call East Asian physical features. It mentions them having uh, darker skin, uh, darker hair, and a short stature. Uh, for centuries, scholars believe that the Huns were um, possibly of the Zhang Yu origin in, uh, from Mongolia. Um, based on these documentary sources left behind by the Romans. There's also some similarities between how the Huns, um, how Hun society worked and how later Mongol uh, society worked uh, in the medieval era. That's of course comparative ethnography, comparing uh, two different societies to each other to learn more about them. That's something that archeologists do quite a bit. Um, we don't know a lot about um, the Huns' uh, spiritual beliefs or what they, how they viewed society because they didn't leave uh, written records behind. Uh, the written records we have of the Huns are written by their enemies, the Romans especially. We do think um, the Huns practice a form of cranial deformation. They bound um, their craniums to make them look more oblong, um, which is something that actually the Romans mentioned that the Huns had unusual shaped heads. We found uh, skulls from uh, Hun people uh, that have uh, deformed craniums. Um, what's interesting though is that more recent DNA tests of people believed to be Huns show that some of them actually were of Caucasian and Eurasian origin, that um, they weren't all East Asian people. So it's led to the question of were the Huns actually a Caucasian and Eurasian people or were they actually East Asian? Um, I think the most plausible explanation though is that the Huns were probably originally East Asian people, possibly from Mongolia. As they spread westward, they brought people into their culture. They brought Eurasian people and uh, Caucasian people into their culture. And that basically the Huns eventually became a, a multiracial society. Um, and also there's the question of bias. 
Uh, the Roman authors writing about the Huns would have wanted to make the Huns look as different from them as possible. So they may have tried to make the Huns seem unusual by talking about how they had darker hair, darker skin, and were shorter and had funny shaped heads. Um, so as archaeologists, we have to mix uh, material evidence with documentary evidence to try to find the most unbiased explanation of who the Huns were and how their society worked. And this image here is of a uh, modern reconstruction of what Attila the Hun might have looked like. This, this uh, image shows him with more uh, Asiatic features and shows some of the weapons and equipment that he would have used, riding on a horse, armed with a, uh, a bow and a sword. These are um, uh, crani craniums that have been deformed or skulls that have been deformed. This was a practice done by the Huns. These are facial reconstructions done on these skulls. Um, these people were believed to have been East Asian. A term that was used in the past is uh, mongoloid, but we don't really use that term anymore. It's, it's considered to be offensive. So these appear to be East Asian Huns. This is um, the mummified remains of a Siberian archer, possibly a Hun warrior. We don't know for sure um, because we don't have written records, but it's possible that this man, when he was alive, was a uh, part of the Hun people. And it looks like uh, he has undergone cranial deformation in life, which of course is a, a hallmark of Hun culture. So now we'll talk about the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 CE. Um, Rome had been captured several times by the Visigoths, by the Vandals. The Huns had invaded uh, Roman territory as well. Uh, the Western Roman Empire was in a time of serious crisis in the 400s. The last Roman emperor, uh, Romulus Augustulus, which means uh, Romulus Little Augustus, because he was probably only about 11 years old, he was deposed in 476 CD, CE by uh, Odoacer. Odoacer was a Germanic captain who had been serving in the Roman military. Odoacer made himself king of it Italy and Unofficially, he made himself a vassal of the Eastern Roman Empire. He probably did this to keep the Eastern Empire from then turning around and invading um, his new kingdom of Italy. By this point, um, Rome, or Ravenna technically, only ruled Italia and a portion of Dalmatia and uh, Sicily and Gaul. Most of the Western Roman Empire had fallen to um, various Germanic tribes. Uh, Gaul had fallen mostly to uh, the Franks, Hispania had mostly been taken over by the Visigoths, and Africa, North Africa, had mostly been taken over by the Vandals. Um, we believe that Odoacer uh, kept the Senate intact. He probably wanted to use um, the Senate as a bureaucracy to help him rule his new kingdom. Um, and some scholars might say that really he was just another Roman emperor, but he didn't refer to himself as an emperor, he referred to himself as a king. Something that the Romans originally had hated. The Romans originally hated kings, but at this point they did not have enough strength to resist Odoacer, or they didn't have the will either. So it's generally believed that there were no more legitimate Roman emperors in the Western Roman Emperor Empire after Romulus Augustulus. Uh, although later European heads of state will compare themselves to Roman emperors as a way to legitimize their, their rule. Uh, the Holy Roman Emp Emperor, uh, the German Kaiser, the Russian Tsar, they'll claim to be like emperors or Caesars, even though they're not really uh, Roman emperors. Some say that the Western Roman Empire never really fell and that um, barbarians basically just became more Roman. They settled in Roman territory. They uh, adopted Latin as a language, you know, creating uh, the modern Romance languages of Italian. French and Spanish, for example. Um, or they say that uh, barbarians, um, in addition to becoming more Roman, Romans became more, more barbarian, giving up a lot of uh, Roman cultural traditions. And I think this tradition, this idea that the Roman Empire did not so much fall as that it slowly collapsed and turned into something else is probably the most historically accurate idea because that's how Roman people would have interpreted uh, the times they were living in the 400s, that it's not so much that their society has a single date on which it fell, 
as it slowly kind of dissolved and became something different. And this image is a gold coin of Romulus Augustulus. Uh, notice just the low quality of uh, the uh, relief. It's, it's very simplistic, it's not very realistic, and it really shows just the turmoil and chaos that the Roman civilization was experiencing as it was transitioning into something very different in the 400s. This is all a territory that the Western Roman Empire could claim by the year 476. As I mentioned, it's basically Italia, a little bit of Dalmatia, and a little tiny portion of Gaul, and then some of Sicily as well. The Eastern uh, Roman Empire, of course, is a lot more durable. This is um, Odoacer accepting Romulus Augustulus' uh, abdication. Um, he did not kill uh, young Romulus. He allowed Romulus to um, live a normal life and actually paid him a pension. It was said that Odoacer took pity on the young man and didn't want to kill him. It's also said that Odoacer was a Christian as well, although he was probably not a uh, Nicene Christian. He was probably an older Aryan Christian. Now we can discuss some other reasons for the decline and um, dissolution of the Roman Empire. Uh, it seems, uh, based on archaeological research, that disease was a much bigger problem in the Roman civilizations than we've thought previously, especially in big cities. Um, a lot of scholars think that Roman public works, you know, toilets, bathhouses, even as they help prevent uh, diseases uh, like typhoid and cholera, they also would have spread diseases like smallpox. As people crowded together in these toilets, they crowded together in these bathhouses, they would have spread airborne diseases. Uh, and of course, these bathhouses and toilets would not have been very clean by modern standards. Romans did not have uh, germ theory. And also um, lead pipes. This is a lead pipe, I think, from uh, Britannia. Um, lead pipes were used to, to carry water uh, through these cities. And of course, we know what lead does to the human body. There are signs of lead poisoning in uh, human remains left behind by late Romans. So in addition to a lack of conquests, um, a stagnant economy, inflation, uh, foreign invasions. There were other factors, uh, domestic factors that would have contributed to the decline of Rome. Uh, diseases caused by their public works, um, lead poisoning, etc. This is um, a graph showing a femur length, length of uh, the leg bones. Um, you know, people get taller right around the year 100 CE, which this period is generally referred to as the Golden Age of, of Rome. There were several very good emperors in a row. Um, the empire was making conquests against its enemies uh, that were successful. And it was a, a good time to be a Roman, uh, basically uh, 50 to about 100 uh, CE. After that, uh, really femur length decreases. You see the crisis of the 200s here. Uh, people are getting uh, shorter because they don't have as much to eat. This is a Shortness versus tallness is generally used as a, uh, uh, a measure by archaeologists just to study how healthy or how prosperous a society is. Taller people, they need more food to eat. They have to eat a healthier diet. Tall people are usually a sign that a society is doing well, whereas shorter people are a sign uh, that a society is struggling. They don't have enough food to eat. Diseases are more common. So at times of prosperity in Rome, we see there's more tall people. And then at times of, of difficulty, like the crisis of the 200s, there's people who are shorter. You see that the height goes up a little bit during the 300s, during the time of Constantine and Theodosius I. But then um, as soon as the um, later 300s roll around uh, and, and Western Roman civilization begins to dissolve, people begin to get shorter again. Uh, and you ultimately see a, a lowered standard of living. These are a graph of shipwrecks. Um, shipwrecks, were not, well, not a good thing for the people involved. Uh, to archaeologists, they're a sign of trade, uh, specifically maritime trade. Um, so when you see a high level of shipwrecks, we know that there's a lot more maritime trade going on because obviously not every ship sinks. And you see that uh, between about 50 and 100 CE, that's where the most shipwrecks are, meaning there's a lot more maritime trade going on in that period than there are in later times. And once again, you see that it drops in the crisis of the 200s. 
it goes back up a little bit in the early to mid 300s and it just basically collapses again uh, as the Roman civilization dissolves in the West. We've also looked at uh, late Roman pottery. Um, the pottery in the late Roman civilization is very rough and coarse. It's not nearly as decorated or as intricate as some of the pottery we looked at in uh, later, earlier videos from Rome. Uh, this is a uh, Mayan ware, which is very rough. It's, it's got bits of rock and things. It's very cheap. This is what's being made later on as the Romans just cannot afford to make as good of pottery. So Syriation would actually show that um, would suggest that less sophisticated pottery is older, but that's why Syriation alone as a relative dating method is not reliable. You have to do other types of, of dating, stratigraphy, documentary sources, and if you do that, you'll realize that this later pottery, which is less sophisticated, is actually um, more recent. So there's a couple of questions that people um, have discussed, scholars and even just regular people who are interested in Roman history. Um, was Rome's fall actually a good thing? Classicists, people who study Greece and Rome, and then medievalists, people who study medieval civilizations, will debate this point. Classicists, as you might expect, they argue that the fall of Rome or decline of Rome was a bad thing because as the Roman Empire ended, there was a lot more warfare and chaos in Western Europe. Um, the infrastructure of the Romans, the aqueducts, the bathhouses, many of them fell into disuse as the population decreased, as there wasn't enough money to maintain them, and a lot of uh, Roman knowledge and scientific discoveries were either lost or forgotten. Medievalists argue instead that actually Rome's fall might have been a good thing because a lot of Roman institutions had become very oppressive uh, by the 200s. Taxation was very high, uh, wealthy people were not really helping poor people anymore, patronage had fallen apart, um, there were a lot of slaves in um, the Roman civilization. Early medieval civilizations still had slavery, but not nearly as many slaves. And it's actually a lot of those slaves may have actually welcomed um, the barbarian invasions. Even many, many poor Romans may have, if not welcomed, at least refused to resist the barbarian invasions because Rome was not really offering them anything good anymore. Um, scholars tend to debate uh, whether... Uh, late Roman or post-Roman people had a higher standard of living. Um, I think that on the whole, the standard of living after the fall of Rome was probably lower for the average person living in, in Western Europe. But scholars will debate that. They might say that you know, maybe people were shorter after the fall of, of Rome, but they had a lot more freedom. Uh, they didn't have to pay high taxes. So it depends on how you define standard of living. Um, originally, the classicists generally won the debate about whether um, the fall of Rome was a, a bad or a good thing, whether people had a better life in Rome uh, or after. But in recent years, the medievalists have really begun to gain an edge in this debate. They really are highlighting how the taxation of, of the late Roman Empire was so oppressive and <clears throat> how uh, slavery was so important in Roman society, but it was less important uh, in medieval society. Serfdom was a more important form of labor in, in medieval European society. Either way, though, the population of, of Western Europe is not going to rebound until centuries later. Uh, particularly urban populations are not going to rebound to Roman era levels until between about the 1500s and the 1800s uh, CE. So really only a couple hundred years ago. Either way, though, many elements of Roman culture did survive um, the dissolution of the Roman Empire, um, especially languages, uh, Gaul, France, uh, it Italia, Italy, Hispania, Spain, and then Dacia, which is now roughly Romania. Um, the invaders took over those territories, adopted many elements of Roman culture, especially the Latin language, which created the Romance languages. Uh, for example, French, uh, Italian, Spanish, Romanian, uh, Portuguese, and Portugal, these are all based on, on Latin. That's why they're called Romance, you know, Roman languages. These barbarian leaders would have done this to legitimize their rule, not only over uh, Romans, but also over their own uh, barbarian subjects. And this will kind of create what's often called the Romanesque period or like Roman period in, in early medieval history. 
the Romanesque period goes from about the 500s to about the 11 or 1200s. But once again, that's a period created by modern historians and archaeologists. It's not a period created by uh, people who actually lived at the time. And the image on this slide is of the Forum of Nerva, 700s to 800s CE. And it basically shows this old Roman uh, gathering place is being used as farmland by uh, medieval Europeans because the population in the cities is so much lower. But at the same time, they don't have to pay the kind of taxes that Romans had to pay. Here's some examples of just post-Roman architecture in the West. This is a Romanesque church in uh, Spain. This one is from about the 800s uh, CE, so it's, it's from a few hundred years after um, uh, the end of the Western Roman Empire. And then on the right, uh, former Roman city centers and forums were often settled by uh, European peasants who used the areas uh, as farmland. And here's a map of the Romance languages. You can see French, Italian, Romanian, Spanish or Castilian and Portuguese are, um, these are uh, based on Latin with uh, other, other words uh, mixed in, but they're mostly uh, Romance languages, mostly from the Latin. So now we'll discuss another important question in uh, the study of Rome. Did Christianity contribute to the Roman Empire's fall? Uh, this question was postulated by uh, the famous British historian uh, Edward Gibbon in his multi-volume History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which um, he published uh, in the late 1700s uh, CE. Uh, Gibbon argued that Christianity made Romans less militaristic and that Christianity drew too many intelligent and virtuous Romans into uh, the priesthood and into monastic orders, uh, that too many basically smart Romans were not uh, joining the military, not joining the Senate, getting into politics. They were becoming monks and priests. As monks, they withdrew from society to study um, uh, Christian uh, spirituality by themselves. As priests, uh, they were not having children. That basically doomed Roman society. Um, I, I think this doesn't really hold up as a theory because monasticism got started in the, the east of the Roman Empire, got started in places like Egypt places that uh, lasted a lot longer uh, in the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, I, I, you know, I also, um, Gibbon was also very anti-Semitic and he tended to view Christianity as kind of an outgrowth of Judaism. So he was going to be biased, not only against uh, Jewish people, but against Christians as well. He was influenced not only by anti-Semitism, but by uh, enlightenment principles that were uh, generally fairly anti-Christian. And there is some truth to Gibbon's argument about um, the Romans' decline. He talks about some of the other problems the Romans face. Uh, the Roman Empire was already in decline by the 200s uh, CE, um, when Christians were a small minority of the population. Uh, even though there were Christians before the 200s, the Christian population doesn't really start growing exponentially until about the uh, 300s. Uh, by 350 is when the Romans um, became a majority Christian civilization. I actually would argue that if anything, Christianity um, and Christians helped to delay the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, they created new systems of obligation to help the poor. Uh, they replaced the patron-client system with a system of charity where wealthy Christians would help uh, poorer Christians and would try to convert non-Christian people to the faith and offer them you know, food and things like that. Also, um, Christianity would have increased the Romans' in-group preference. Um, they would have united around this new religion of Christianity, seeing um, Christianity and being Roman as being linked. To be Christian would have meant being Roman and vice versa. And the barbarians that were invading, of course, were not uh, Christian. They would have been uh, pagan, worshiping Germanic gods. Eventually, though, of course, uh, these, these Germanic barbarians, they adopt Christianity just as they adopt other elements of Roman culture. So... Um, I actually argue that, uh, if anything, Christianity helped to delay the fall of the Roman civilization. Another question that's often asked, and this is a question that's asked more by, I would say, general um, students or general people who have an interest in the Roman civilization is, was Rome on the verge of an industrial revolution before its fall? I would argue yes and no. Um, 
in some ways, I think the Romans had the engineering and mechanical knowledge um, to begin an industrial revolution. This is a, um, a noria or a water mill. It's believed to have been built um, sometime between 350 uh, CE and maybe the 1200s CE. Uh, of course, if it was built in the 1200s, it would not have been built by um, the Eastern Roman Empire. This is in Syria. It would have been built by uh, uh, Arab people who had taken over the region at that point. But the design for the Noria is actually from Vitruvius, uh, who is, of course, a Roman engineer that we discussed previously. Also, um, this water wheel would have pumped water from this river up into this aqueduct and then sent it into a bathhouse. So it's a ver very uh, sophisticated piece of technology. Water wheels were, of course, a big part of the Industrial Revolution uh, of the 17th and 1800s uh, CE. This is a um, steam engine developed by um, Hero of Alexandria. Hero was technically Greek, but the Romans knew about Hero's steam engine. So they had, the Romans had access to engineering uh, technology and engineering knowledge. They also had access to a lot of the important materials needed for an industrial revolution, namely coal and steel. Coal to power steam engines and steel, which is a, a mix of iron and coal to make things like um, uh, steam engines. Uh, you know, they have to be a lot stronger. Um, iron is too brittle. Steel is much stronger than, than iron. But the Romans didn't really make a lot of steel. They basically made steel for weapons and armor, and that was about it. They didn't think of making pots and kettles out of steel, for example. Um, so those are, those are factors that would say that, yes, maybe the Romans were on the verge of an industrial revolution. Uh, the no factors are uh, the Romans didn't seem to have the necessary maritime technology um, to make the industrial revolution work. Um, the Romans uh, were, were skilled sailors by the standards of their day, but they mostly sailed in the Mediterranean. Uh, their ships would not have um, handled very well uh, out in the Atlantic Ocean, for example, which is much stormier. Also, the Romans probably only sailed seasonally, seasonally as well. During the winter time, they probably would have stopped sailing unless it was an emergency. Uh, and I, I bring up maritime technology because um, in the United States, um, logistical and transportation issues uh, the difficulty of travel uh, drove industrialization. America's uh, rough topography, its poor roads, led to the creation of things like steamboats and canals and railroads, which were an important part of the American Industrial Revolution. The Romans, however, they could travel across the Mediterranean Sea fairly easily, unless it was a winter storm, and they had their Roman roads. So the Romans might not have felt a need to build things like railroads or uh, steamboats or things of that nature. Uh, I think another factor uh, in the no section is uh, Romans did not have a modern banking investment and market system to pay their wage laborers and to fund entrepreneurs who could have developed technologies like these or manufactured technologies like these. Um, they relied a lot more on, on slavery and obligation uh, based labor systems. Basically, um, the Industrial Revolution of the 17-1800s was driven not only by technology and uh, necessity, but it was driven by uh, financial systems that developed in uh, the late medieval period and the early modern period. And the Romans, uh, while they had gold and silver coins, they did not have the kind of banking and investment system that would have allowed people to um, uh, invest to make new technologies. And of course, necessity is the mother of invention. If the Romans were content with the technology they had, there's no reason for them to invent new technologies. So on the whole, I think that the Romans were not on the verge of an industrial revolution. The final section of this video will be a discussion of the Eastern Roman Empire after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire is often called the Byzantine Empire, um, although the um, people who lived in the Eastern Empire did not refer to themselves as the Byzantines. They referred to themselves as Romans. In their minds, they were the Roman Empire. The term uh, Byzantine Empire is actually invented in the 1500s, about 100 years after the final fall of, of Constantinople. And to begin our discussion of the Eastern Roman Empire, known to us today as the Byzantine Empire, I want to talk about why the Eastern Empire survived 
uh, for much longer than the Western Empire um, did. The Western Empire falls in 476 CE, and the Eastern uh, Empire falls in 1453, uh, almost a thousand years later. And archaeologists, historians, and scholars will debate this question. Um, some possible answers are the Eastern Empire was wealthier than the Western Empire, uh, and thus it was better able to uh, fund its defense. For most of, of Roman history, the Western portions of the empire were poorer than the Eastern portions. Uh, there was a lot more trade in the Eastern parts of the empire, uh, trade especially with the, the, the Far East. Uh, the most agriculturally productive parts of the Roman Empire were in the East, places like Egypt, for example. The largest urban centers in the empire, besides Rome itself, were in the east of the, uh, the empire, and there just is more wealth and more people in the east and the west, and those resources that the eastern empire can use to uh, survive for a lot longer. Um, there's some geographic things that are important as well. The eastern empire, especially uh, Greece and the Balkans, south of the Danube River, are uh, generally more mountainous than other parts of the western Roman Empire. Remember, Italy has mountains, but the mountains in Italy are much easier to, to traverse than uh, the mountains in Greece, and this allowed Rome to build a, a large civilization, centralized civilization, uh, in a way that the Greeks did not until much later in their history. So what was initially a uh, asset for the Romans, the lack of um, really, really difficult mountains to climb in Italy itself, um, on the Italian peninsula, of course, because the Alps are a thing further to the north, uh, the, the more mountainous um, topography of, of Greece and the Balkans, I would argue, makes it more difficult for barbarian armies um, early on to take over the Eastern Empire. And it's going to make it harder for later armies like the Ottoman Turks as well, who will eventually take over those territories. But it's going to be a much slower process. And Eastern cities uh, like Constantinople, I would argue, are just better suited and better placed for defense. Um, Constantinople, like Rome, had uh, large walls, but the uh, people of Constantinople were able to fortify uh, not just their walls, but the, uh, the harbors and bays around the city as well. And they could um, use these harbors to bring in supplies and things, but they also were able to keep out uh, naval attacks from their enemies, at least for hundreds of years. Eventually, Constantinople is going to fall. The Ottoman Turks are going to find ways to work around the defenses of Constantinople. But the Constantinople um, defenses included things like uh, obviously walls, but chains in the harbor to prevent ships from sailing in, enemy ships from sailing in. The people of Constantinople will use Greek fire, a uh, invention that will allow them to burn enemy ships. I'll show an image of, of Greek fire on a future slide. And better fortifications in these cities allows, I would argue, these cities, especially Constantinople, to survive for a lot longer than Western Roman cities. Additionally, uh, the Eastern Empire has a, a larger population, we generally think. By the 300s, we think that the, most of the empire's population, about 60%, were living in what we would call the Eastern Empire, um, Greece, Balkans, Anatolia, the Middle East, and then um, Egypt and parts of Eastern North Africa. In fact, Constantinople may have had a population of a million inhabitants by the 500s uh, CE. So it becomes uh, as large as Rome. It will certainly overtake Rome. Rome's population is going to uh, really, really decrease. At about the same time, the early 500s, Rome may have only had 30,000 people living there. A larger urban population will allow for uh, larger armies of citizens uh, of your culture, uh, people who live and adopt your culture, rather than having to rely on um, federati um, who have a different culture. And that's going to give uh, more stability to the military of the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, there were, of course, non-Roman people living in the Eastern Empire. They had some federati as well, but they're gonna be able to have more citizen uh, troops because their population, especially their urban population is larger. I should add a caveat though, that a lot of the census data we have on the Roman civilization after the 100s CE is very fragmentary uh, and different census taking methodologies are used at different points in history. 
Sometimes children are counted, sometimes they're not counted, sometimes slaves are counted, sometimes they're not counted. So we have a lot of, we do a lot of speculation uh, using other kinds of documentary sources, other kinds of material sources to try to figure out um, the size of the population in the Eastern Roman Empire. But we generally agree as scholars that the Eastern Empire had a larger population than the Western Empire, which allowed them to have larger armies and be able to do a lot more to defend themselves. This last point um, is interesting, but it's certainly a subject for debate as well. Uh, the Eastern Empire ethnically and demographically was different than the Western Empire. Um, there was a larger Greek population, there were larger uh, Christian populations, larger Middle Eastern and North African populations. In some ways, this is just because the Eastern Empire has a larger population in general. Uh, but I would argue that because of the different ethnic groups, the Roman patronage system of patron and client, it exists to a degree in the Eastern Empire, but um, it's different there. You're going to have other uh, obligation systems. Um, you have Christian systems of obligation where wealthy Christians are supposed to help uh, poor Christians in the church. Um, you also have the Byzantine bureaucracy as well that I would argue replaces um, the older Roman patronage networks. Uh, that's actually where we get the term um, Byzantine, a Byzantine bureaucracy, a complex hard to understand bureaucracy comes from the Byzantine Empire. Remember, the Byzantines did not call themselves Byzantines. That's a historical term that's developed later. And so this bureaucracy helps to keep the, uh, the Eastern Empire together for longer. Other forms of obligation, like uh, Christian obligation, help to keep the empire together for longer. So there's some uh, pretty good reasons uh, for why scholars think the Eastern Roman Empire lasts about a thousand years longer than the uh, Western Roman Empire um, lasts. An image on this slide is a uh, mosaic uh, featuring Justinian I, who uh, ruled from 527 to 565. This is actually in Ravenna um, from part of the former Western Empire. Justinian will try to rebuild the Roman Empire. He will try to reconquer uh, lost Western territories. This map shows the Eastern Roman Empire at its greatest extent with the territories brought in uh, under Justinian I. We see Italia, parts of North Africa, and parts of uh, Hispania brought into the Eastern Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire, however, will not be able to maintain control of these territories. This is uh, Justinian and his uh, empress, Theodora. Um, the Byzantines or the Eastern Roman Empire, they really um, invest a lot in 2D art. They, they made 3D art, they made sculptures, but they were generally um, less comfortable with sculptures, probably because they associated sculptures and statues with idolatry. Uh, this Eastern Roman Empire was uh, Christian. So now we'll talk about Justinian I, the most famous Eastern Roman emperor, his policies, uh, some of the things that he did, and how he helped to redefine the culture of the uh, Eastern Roman Empire or uh, the Byzantine Empire. So Justinian I, he wanted to uh, reconquer uh, lost territories that had been part of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, he wanted to relive uh, the glory of the old uh, united uh, Roman Empire. And because of this, he's often called the last Roman because of his desire to um, reconquer um, lost territories and to bring uh, glory to the Eastern Roman Empire. And so he will conquer Italy and parts of North Africa and Spain. And these conquests do bring in a lot of wealth um, and plunder into the, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, but they also are going to cost the Eastern Empire as well. They're going to be very expensive and they're going to take um, the empire's focus away from domestic issues and other, other problems and, and put it more on what's going on uh, to the West. A lot of the money uh, that's brought in from the conquests, uh, Justinian will use um, that wealth to have some very expensive building and public works projects made. We'll talk a bit more about those uh, infrastructure and public works projects in the coming slides. 
And these conquests and these projects are very expensive, and they're going to deplete the Roman uh, treasury. Even as Justinian is bringing in uh, wealth into the empire, a lot of wealth is being expended as well um, during this period. That's going to make it very difficult for his successors to defend uh, the eastern frontier of uh, the, the empire, particularly from um, the rising um, Arab Islamic powers um, after the 600s CE. They're going to lose a lot of territory to those expanding um, eastern Arab Islamic powers. That's, of course, going to be very, very damaging to uh, the empire. They're going to lose very important territories uh, like Egypt, for example. And they're going to lose territory in the Middle East. And the conquest and spending um, initiated by Justinian is going to leave uh, the empire distracted uh, and without the resources it would need to combat uh, the Justinian plague. And this is a pandemic um, that was probably caused by the Yersinia pestis bacteria, the same um, pathogen that caused the bubonic plague that afflicted Europe in the 1300s and, and after. So you have a plague, you have um, increased spending. Uh, these things are going to hurt uh, the uh, Eastern Roman Empire. But despite uh, these, these issues, um, there's a lot of um, really important things and really important cultural changes that are happening um, during Justinian's reign and, and after. Um, Eastern Roman culture, um, what might be called Byzantine culture, is going to do really develop uh, during Justinian's reign. Um, there's going to be a decreased use of sculpture uh, during um, Justinian's reign and after, and increased use of 2D art, um, visual art like mosaics. Um, we think that uh, the Christian uh, Eastern Romans, they were perhaps uncomfortable with sculptures. Perhaps sculptures reminded them too much of idolatry. There are sculptures from the Eastern Roman Empire, but not as many as you might expect. There's also going to be a lot more use of the Greek language, too, in uh, the Eastern Roman uh, Empire. Greek had, had long been the vernacular, the, the language of everyday life and business in the Eastern Roman Empire. And um, in fact, to be a Roman living in the Eastern Empire, you had to know Greek as well to be cultured. The Romans liked Greek culture, but now, um, because of Justinian and then later um, emperors, Greek is going to become the legal uh, language, the du jour language of the Eastern Roman Empire instead of Latin. There's also going to be, um, Justinian is going to create a, a civil law code, which will be a mix of Christian and Roman legal theories. He's going to build on older Roman law, bringing in some Christian ideas as well into the law. So a new civil law code, Greek becoming a... Um, cultural and legal language for the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, 2D art uh, becoming more prominent, 3D art becoming less prominent. Um, there's some cultural changes that are happening in the wake of Justinian as well, in addition to his conquests and his building projects. And on the whole, Justinian I is seen as being a good leader. Um, he's called the last Roman because of his desire to um, relive the glory of the old Roman Empire, but just as he's trying to relive the, the glory of the old Roman Empire, he's also helping to change the Eastern Roman Empire, making it more different um, than the Western Roman Empire. Um, what might be called the Byzantine Empire today. But remember, the term Byzantine Empire was not used by uh, Byzantines or Eastern Roman people. They thought of themselves as Romans, even as their culture was changing a little bit. This is the, the Byzantine flag. Uh, the four Bs represent um, uh, King of Kings uh, reigns in the kingly city. The King of Kings is a reference to uh, um, Jesus Christ, uh, not to the Byzantine emperor, but it's saying that basically Jesus rules in, in the Byzantine city in Constantinople. And if, if, if Jesus is ruling, then it also legitimizes the role of the uh, Byzantine emperor. This image shows a uh, Byzantine uh, naval vessel uh, fighting against um, a Slavic attack. It's from about the year 821 CE. Uh, the caption uh, in Greek reads, the Roman fleet burned down the opposite fleet. And um, the Byzantines 
we call them the Byzantines, although they would not have called themselves the Byzantines. They, they refer to themselves as Romans. Uh, the term Byzantine Empire is from the 1500s, used by a German historian. Um, they would thought of themselves as the Romans, as the heirs of Roman culture, even though they spoke Greek and they, um, their capital city was Constantinople, they thought of themselves as being Roman. They also uh, called Constantinople the city, just like the Romans called Rome the city. Here's another uh, shot of uh, Constantinople um, in, in the uh, sort of at the end of the late antiquity period, the beginning of the early medieval period. You can see the old Hippodrome uh, where chariot races took place well into the medieval era. You can also see the uh, Church of the Hagia Sophia, which was built during Justinian's reign. This is uh, the Hagia Sophia or Church of Holy Wisdom. It was built at about 537 CE by Justinian. These minarets uh, were added uh, after 1453 when Constantinople was captured by the Ottoman Turks and Hagia Sophia was turned into a, uh, a mosque. This is the interior of uh, the Hagia Sophia. You can see its domes. The domes are of course a hallmark of Roman architecture, but they've been decorated in uh, other traditions. Some of these decorations are, are not original. They were added by the Ottoman Turks when the, the, the church was turned into a mosque. So there's many elements of Roman architecture, uh, the domes, arches, uh, these, these composite order columns here. Um, there's also uh, some departures from Roman styles. There's a lot more mosaics. Uh, remember the mosaics were very important to uh, the Eastern Roman Empire as they moved away from uh, 3D art in favor of 2D art. Uh, this is actually of St. John. Also, there's little mismatches in the construction. Often there's different numbers of columns on each level of the Hagia Sophia. This was not a mistake made by the architects. Rather, this was actually a conscious decision on their part. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans had sought perfection in their uh, construction. They wanted to make everything look as perfect as possible. Byzantine and Eastern Roman architects, however, they wanted their buildings to actually look a little bit imperfect. They did this because they wanted to show that creation was imperfect, but God was perfect. So even though there's many similarities between the Hagia Sophia and Byzantine architecture and art, there's some differences as well, particularly around their understanding of perfection. Here's the plan of the Hagia Sophia. It's much more square than, um, than a Western basilica, which is rectangular. Here are some examples of some of the imperfections, if you can call them that, of the, the Hagia Sophia. There's four columns on the first level, but then there are about six columns on the second level. And this is designed on purpose. This is designed to show this is uh, creation. Uh, it's, it's not God. This is a, a work of humans, and therefore it is imperfect. It's another uh, piece of architecture uh, built uh, by Justinian. Uh, it's the uh, Basilica Cistern. This um, cistern would have held water um, from rainstorms to um, give the, the city extra water beyond what was brought in by the aqueducts. It was damaged during the Nika riots of 532 CE, early in Justinian's reign. So he basically renovated and expanded these, uh, these cisterns and built some really beautiful Corinthian style columns and uh, arches in what is basically a giant water tank. These are um, gorgon heads or medusa heads um, that were placed in uh, the basilica cisterns. It's not clear what their use was. Uh, they're placed sideways and upside down. It's possible that uh, Justinian was recycling older pagan uh, architecture and using it in the cisterns. And he was probably putting them upside down to show that uh, paganism no longer had power in the Eastern Roman or, or Byzantine Empire, and he was trying to show that Christianity had triumphed in architecture. But we don't know for sure. This is just uh, archaeologists' speculation. And this is just a plan and rendering of the Basilica Cisterns to give you an idea of how large this, this public works project was. Um, you know, Justinian was building a lot of really expensive public works projects, which would have made his 
his citizens very happy with him, but they were also very expensive. And the high cost would have meant that the empire would have had challenges dealing with other problems, like the Justinian plague or foreign invasions. So I want to talk about daily life in the Eastern Roman uh, slash Byzantine Empire. Uh, Greek was much more important in the Eastern Roman Empire slash Byzantine Empire than it was in the Old Roman Empire. In the Old Roman Empire, Greek was used along with Latin. In uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, Greek is going to be the primary vernacular language, and it's going to eventually um, be the language uh, of the law, especially seen in the Justinian Code. Um, and um, Christianity is going to be the official religion, the state religion. Um, eventually, uh, that will become uh, what is called Eastern Orthodox Christ Christianity after the church breaks into the Eastern Orthodox Church and the uh, Western uh, Roman Catholic Church. In terms of economy, the uh, Eastern Roman Empire actually had a very diverse and very advanced economy by the standards of the day. They had major industries like agriculture, mining, some industry and manufacturing, and a lot of trade as well. Trade particularly between the East, Asia, and the West in Europe. Constantinople was a very important kind of way station between East and West. And so traders operating in Constantinople could make a lot of money. Byzantine ship captains transporting goods could make a lot of money. And that brings a lot of prosperity into the Eastern Roman Empire, as long as they're in charge of trade, as long as they have control of Constantinople. Like uh, the Greek civilization and the old Roman Empire, um, they also relied on slavery as well. And um, it would, it's been argued that slaves had a better um, opportunity um, to get free in the Eastern Roman Empire. They had more rights and more ways to redress grievances against their masters. This may have been because of Christianity. Um, it may have been because of different ideas about who could be a slave. The Eastern uh, Roman Empire, uh, the Byzantines, did, did not like to have slaves from amongst their own people. Um, this was common amongst the uh, Greeks and the Romans as well. Um, they got uh, slaves from um, uh, Arab traders, um, and they got slaves from uh, amongst the Slavic people as well. And the modern English word, and in many other languages as well, for slave um, comes from Slav, because so many Slavic people were um, enslaved by uh, other cultures. And um, in terms of gender relations, uh, the Byzantine civilization is uh, very patriarchal, just like uh, Greco-Roman society was. Um, although there are some Christian influences in sexual relations, um, they have things like segregated spaces in their homes, kind of like the, uh, the Greeks did with um, the Andron and uh, Gynoseum. But because of the Christian influences in uh, Byzantine society, uh, sexual relationships outside of marriage, both for men and for women, are going to be uh, very taboo. Remember, um, in, in pagan Roman and pagan Greek society, uh, women could not have sexual relations outside of marriage unless they were prostitutes. And, but men could have those relationships outside of marriage as long as they were discreet and they kept up their obligations. The Byzantine people, they had a preference for uh, Christian, Christianity, Christian culture. They certainly had a preference for Greco-Roman culture over what they saw as barbarian culture, culture that was non-Greco-Roman and non-Christian. So they would have looked down on Slavic people who were not Christian. They would have looked down on people from the Middle East, Arabs who were uh, either not Christian or Muslim. They would have looked down on, later on, the Turks who were uh, Muslim. And um, there's also a very complex uh, political system and a bureaucracy that develops in the Byzantine Empire. It's where we get the term Byzantine, meaning complex or confusing or corrupt from. And basically, this, this bureaucracy it replaces the older Greco-Roman or Roman styles of social obligation. Um, this bu bureaucracy helps to rule the empire and keeps the empire together, but this bureaucracy is very corrupt. It's very expensive to operate, and I would argue that the bureaucracy also plays a role in, its, in the downfall of the Eastern Roman Empire. It just 
it becomes too corrupt uh, for its uh, own good. There's also tensions between the emperors and the nobility in uh, the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire, just like in the old Roman Empire. And we have sources, uh, historical sources, that document the relationships between emperors and the elite. There's documents like Procopius's Secret History from the 500s and um, Anna Comnena's uh, Alexiad from the uh, 1100s. And uh, the Byzantines, the Eastern Romans, they like to have fun, just like uh, the old Roman Empire and the, the Greeks that came before them did. Um, they had theater and they also had chariot races. Chariot races were especially popular in Constantinople. Byzantine chariot fans were passionate about uh, chariot racing. They were divided into factions, uh, almost like modern sports teams. They, they were called the Blues and the Greens. Uh, and basically, the modern historians and archaeologists argue that these chariot races, these sporting events, they kept the uh, Eastern Roman uh, people, the commoners, divided amongst themselves. Um, they look at events like the Nika riots, where the Blues and the Greens who liked different chariot factions. They didn't normally like each other, but they came together against um, Emperor Justinian. And then of course, the Nika riots uh, are brutally suppressed by Justinian. Um, this is in 532 CE. Some, some estimates are that perhaps as many as 30,000 uh, rioters were killed by Justinian's troops. So you also have kind of a bread and circuses system uh, in the, the Byzantine Empire where the commoners are entertained by sporting events, and that keeps them from uh, rising up um, against uh, the empire. But you'll also see the empire becomes weaker over time for slightly different reasons than um, the, the old Roman Empire uh, collapses. I think the problem that the Eastern Roman Empire faced was that uh, it's not a, it couldn't have enough conquests the way the old Roman Empire did. Um, but they couldn't hang on to the territories they had. And they had some very valuable territories. They had uh, you know, mines, gold and silver mines in the Balkans. They had very rich agricultural areas down in Egypt, and they could not hang on to those territories. And so they lose um, very rich, very um, profitable areas, and that will ultimately um, spell disaster for their empire. They also faced encroachments from both uh, the East and the West. Um, Western European people, uh, during the Crusades and even afterwards are attacking Constantinople. They're seizing control of Byzantine trade networks, which is gonna really hurt the Eastern Roman Empire financially. And if you don't have a good economy, you can't pay your soldiers and pay for your defense. They're also being uh, assailed from the East. They're losing territory to various um, Islamic powers, um, Arabs, and then eventually the Turks. And so the Byzantine Empire, it, it is unable to defend itself and it loses territory and in losing territory it loses revenue and then without revenue they can't even hold on to Constantinople and the images on this slide are uh, mosaics on the left is a uh, mosaic of a Byzantine uh, man and woman you can see there's some continuities between Byzantine fashion and uh, old Roman uh, fashion uh, this is uh, Belisarius, a um, Eastern Roman uh, general who oversaw the conquest of uh, former Western Roman territories or reconquest of former Western Roman territories. And this is uh, a mosaic of a man leading a camel. It's called the Camel Ride Mosaic. It's from um, a, uh, the Royal Palace in Constantinople, now Istanbul. Uh, it's, I think, an older piece. It's older than these, these mosaics. Uh, the style looks more of the old Roman style. I suspect that this man leading the camel is probably meant to be a slave of some kind based on the, the garb he's wearing. Slaves often wore these very short um, sleeveless tunics, kind of like a tank top almost. And it seems that the, uh, the men that are on the camel are dressed a lot nicer. So it's probably a slave leading a camel for two wealthier people. The city of Constantinople fell on May 29th, 1453, nearly a thousand years after the end of the Western Roman Empire. Um, 
Constantine the 11th, Paleologos, was the last Byzantine emperor or, or Eastern Roman emperor. He was defeated by um, Sultan uh, Mehmed II, also known as Fatih Mehmed or Mehmed the Conqueror. Um, Mehmed and the Ottoman Turks, they conquered the city of Constantinople using new technology, especially gunpowder weapons, which they used to break down the uh, walls of Constantinople. And so in the end, even though it lasted um, nearly a thousand years longer than the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire did eventually fall. This is all that was left of the Eastern Roman Empire by about the time of the fall of Constantinople. You can see the purple is Byzantine territory, so they have a little bit of territory around uh, Constantinople, and then they have a little bit of territory in the Peloponnesian Peninsula uh, of Greece. Remember, the Peloponnesian Peninsula is where uh, the Mycenaean Greeks lived pr predominantly, and it's also where Sparta was. So. Um, the uh, Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire was a shadow of its former self by the time it uh, was officially conquered in, in 1453. Conclusion. We've covered a lot of ground in this course in our discussion of um, the so-called classical civilizations, uh, the Greek civilization and the Roman civilization, how these civilizations changed over time. And um, to conclude, I will very briefly um, mention the influence uh, the Greek and Roman civilizations have had on other cultures and civilizations, particularly on what is known as Western culture or Western civilization. And the Roman Empire, like the Greek civilization, would inspire political and cultural systems of many other countries, civilizations, and empires across time. In spite of the numerous problems that the Greek and Roman civilizations faced, um, in spite of the problems that the Romans faced um, from the 200s CE on, and even before the 200s, uh, as you'll remember from uh, previous videos, uh, there's still a lot that we can learn from these uh, civilizations. Even if they got certain things wrong, they got a lot of things right as well. And these uh, classical civilizations, as they're called, they're going to form the foundation of, of what is um, known as Western civilization, um, particularly after the Roman Empire adopts Christianity and incorporates Christianity and culture, um, Christian culture into its own culture. Western civilization is basically elements of Greek culture, elements of Roman culture mixed in with elements of, of Christian culture. And those uh, cultures mixed together and they're modified um, over time uh, during the medieval period, during the Renaissance, and then of course uh, during uh, the early modern and modern periods. And just as we learn from the good things that uh, the Romans did and that the Greeks did, we also learn from their decline as well. And the Roman civilization will decline gradually, as, as we've discussed, um, due to a variety of external and internal factors. Internal factors being uh, debasement of currency, overspending, uh, infl causing inflation, increased cost of living, I would also argue that uh, the Roman civilization's reliance on, on slave labor will cause a lot of instability as well, along with the obvious uh, moral issues that come with, with um, slave labor. But many other ancient civilizations besides the Romans, the Greeks, um, their adversaries relied on slavery as well. Uh, I think it would be um, unfair to just focus on uh, Roman slavery and not also decry the issues with slavery in other cultures. But these internal factors, uh, the over-reliance on slavery, um, the uh, inflation of the currency, uh, corruption amongst the uh, Roman elite, uh, the failing of Roman systems of patronage, uh, elite patrons no longer helping poor clients, these are internal problems that will cause the Roman civilization to decline and fall. External factors are the Roman military is not making enough military conquests. These military conquests bring both wealth and labor in the form of uh, captives and slaves into the empire. These conquests slow down, 
hurting the, the internal systems. Uh, and as the Roman uh, Empire is not conquering, it's um, facing invasions and migrations of non-Roman people, like the Germanic peoples. Um, some of those Germanic peoples become part of the Roman military. They become uh, foederati, but others will uh, fight against the Romans and they will sack Rome and will ultimately um, defeat uh, Rome, the last Roman emperor by, uh, in the West by 476. And in the East, the Eastern Empire, of course, will live on longer uh, for other reasons, uh, geographic reasons, demographic reasons that we discussed previously. And the Eastern um, Roman Empire uh, centered on Constantinople will ultimately be captured by the Ottoman Turks in 1453, uh, just under a thousand years after uh, Rome falls, um, the Western Empire falls uh, for the last time in 476. And even though these uh, civilizations do not last forever, uh, their culture will impact later cultures. Um, Latin will be the language of education and knowledge in the medieval European world and in the Renaissance and even in the early modern world. Uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, or Eastern Roman Empire will impact medieval culture as well. And um, these cultures are going to uh, continue on even after the civilizations that develop them have faded away. And we can see many uh, inspirations, elements of inspiration from uh, Greco-Roman cultures in later civilizations. Uh, on the right-hand side of the slide is Michelangelo's David, done in a uh, classical Greco-Roman style, but it's made in the Renaissance. Renaissance uh, Europeans were very interested in rediscovering and learning about um, uh, classical Greco-Roman cultures. Architecture is heavily influenced by Greco-Roman architecture to create what is called neoclassical architecture. This is the uh, U.S. Capitol building featuring um, Greco-Roman style columns and arches, but also a uh, dome. Uh, the dome was put in in uh, 1866. So there's many, many elements and many um, examples, both documentary and material of the persistence of Greco-Roman of classical cultures, even after the classical civilizations uh, collapsed. And because of the, um, the achievements of these civilizations and because of their influence on uh, civilizations in the present, we are still studying uh, the Greek and Roman civilizations. We still study their material culture and we still study their documentary sources. And we will continue to study them and uh, learn from them for many years to come.